Uh, you know snapping for that you and me. A winning streak, let's get another one from you and C. BCS still hating on us like they do it usually. We still gon' kill these other teams and read some eulogies. We just did a show in North Carolina and put Duke to sleep. Almost put a 50 burger, had they whole squad nervous. Solo D is always classic, what I do on beats. And I'ma throw this shoe forever, it ain't new to me. Uh, I've been rapping since the Orange Bowl. Meteorologists from everywhere the storm goes. Just check my closet, Kane's gear all in my wardrobe. Anywhere we take the field, we turn it to a war zone. Yeah, heard the tall hills ballin', we ain't never scared. We gon' turn hard rock into Gettysburg. They callin' for a shootout, might be a wild day. Let's light some up, we gotta hold it down for our blade. Even in the quarantine, we support the team. We tryna get another year from King and Orange and Green. All the recruits know the truth, it's all about that you. So bring your ass to the crib, tryna make moves. We smokin' like a Garcia when you spark the flame. Bunch of canes hit Hall of Fame, go ahead, Jason James. Can't gang, can't complain, we always ride. When UNC come in, I think we gon' Nate Robinson them. You know snapping for that you is me A winning streak, let's get another one from UNC BCS still hating on us like they do it usually We still gon' kill these other teams and read some eulogies We just did a show in North Carolina and put Duke to sleep Almost put a 50 burger, had they whole squad nervous Solo D is always classic, what I do on beats And I'ma throw the shoe forever, it ain't new to me uh. school to the pros this guy knows the game so you better not be half stepping i can guarantee you most of the audience is gonna agree with me before they agree with you strap in because coach hayes is about to crack your premium and fertilize your brain go ahead and right here right now subscribe now and check out coach hayesfootball.com C A N E S Canes. Disappointed is an understatement. I can't find a word that can describe my feelings right. I got fire in my eyes, man. I'm hot, dog. I'm hot. And I'm gonna start off just like this. This is how I feel inside. This the That's exactly how I feel. I'm going to open up the phone lines, but before I do, I'm going to bring my people in real quick. Haitian hey, Ellen, what's up with you, baby? I got the poor little Timmy shirt on. You're exactly right. I had to switch out. It is what it is. I got to call a spade a spade. And if you're a true Kane fan, you got the right to say those things. It's just being real, right? Uh, let, let me get into this, man. I'm not going to be labeled a point. Like, I'm hurt, dog. But I got my guest on, uh, uh, V12. I got Balin back in the building. He had to take care of some things this morning, but we got a special guest on, which should definitely would have been on the better terms. But hey, when I can get him, I'm gonna get him. So let's do it. <sighs> V12, talk to me, man. What's up with you, man? Yeah, coach. To be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed in you because I wouldn't even have played that clip of Air Reed because they didn't even deserve it. It was nothing like that. That's the total disrespect to. Air Reed uh, type football team of uh, what we saw today. Um, I am extremely hurt as well as you are. The word I can say, and I know, I, I and to me, it's, it was it was horrible. It was a massacre. And I know Balin may have some words as well, but that clip you played by Air Reed, we haven't seen any of that. We saw none of that tonight. No spirit especially on defense, the offense tried to fight. That's all I can say. Bad, bad day for you in football. Got a lot to talk about. All day, man. Real quick, I, I forgot my little intro piece. Uh, for those that are in the comment section, y'all banging it right now. I appreciate you. Hit that button, that like button. Uh, get this algorithm jumping. Also, make sure if you can hear me uh, clear, hit the thumbs up right quick. If the audio is good, visual is good, I, I don't want to be talking and people miss what we have to say. Uh, Cause like I said, I think we got a very special guest on that can really give us some insight. 
So uh, while I'm waiting on that real quick, um, let me see here. All right, real quick, man, bringing in my man, Mr. Quarterback Guru himself, just had a, a good camp today. Couldn't make it this morning, which I totally understand, man. Baylon, talk to us, man. That was absolutely terrifying, horrifying, and embarrassing. And you know what? At the end of the day, it's weird to say. I'd rather get dominated like that and just know we, we got humbled and worked better than to lose a tough one that we know we should have won. There is no way in in God's green earth we should have won that football game. Absolutely not. It was horrendous. Defense looked terrible. You know, but like like my boy said, that your special guest, he said it's football. It is football. You win some, you lose some. So it is what it is. But, man, to, to lose like that on the national stage, you know, maybe they could have wished it was a night game so that the running backs couldn't see the freaking holes clear. You know, that's what you're we hoping <laughs> for. But, yeah, just bad, bad, bad day for, for Kane football. I heard that, man. Before I, before I bring on our, our third guest, uh, I'm going to do this, man, because I always like to give respect for those who – who helped this program out real quick, man. Big shout out to OG Kane with a $20 donation. Thank you very much, man. And he says, answer this coach. How, how is this all coaching when players missing tackles and bad angles and getting cooked on fly routes? Uh, it was all good just a week ago. I heard that. Uh, now fire coaches just saying no player accountability. Uh, and we're going to definitely jump into that. OG Kane, man, you're hundred percent right. Uh, I believe there's a lot of fault to go around across the board. Um, but but I am more with you on coaching than it is players at this point, um, and I'm going to tell you why. But I'll definitely get into that. I don't want to hold our guest any longer. But before I do, let me go ahead and give you your respect, man, and I appreciate you. All right, man, OG Cam, I appreciate you. So here we go, man, our last guest, man. I'm going to bring him on without further ado. What's going on, man? Kevin Olsen in the house. You got your mic muted and turn your, your camera sideways if you don't mind. Okay, yourself. Your yeah, man. Gotcha. Gotcha. You guys Perfect, hear me? Perfect, man. Got you loud and clear, man. I appreciate you. Appreciate oh, you yeah, coming appreciate on, man. Appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks, man. Hey, hate that it's under these circumstances. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But you here. And, and I guess this would be a great time, especially to have a true insider and not an outsider like ourselves, you know, that's part of the program. You can probably give us a little more insight and some of these fans and listeners more insight, man. I really appreciate you. Oh, of course. You know, I, I think these games get a little out of hand real fast. And mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's so many plays that when you look back at that game where we watched that really changed the game. You know, the, mm -hmm. the fourth and short early where Chaz Surratt made a big play inside that hole on the running back real short like that. Those kind of plays really change the game, right? And they don't let it get out of hand to 38-12, to 38-10, right? Like if you just if you just execute on some of those plays that are the big swing plays, that enables you to get up like that. So North Carolina won those plays on a lot of occasions, on a lot of third and shorts, fourth and shorts. Big plays, like even after Miami went down and scored in 40 seconds, the next play, they're running five rushes down the field. They, they ran five play drives, and they run the ball five times, and now they're at the five-yard line. You know, like they just couldn't get out of their own way today. And, you know, I've been a part of some of those kind of losses. And mm -hmm. they're tough, but they show you a lot about your team. And, you know, I really do think that, Manny Diaz and Coach Lashley and all those guys really have Miami going in the right in the right direction. Um, you know, you don't you don't see the silliness and the silly penalties and you know sometimes teams just beat you and that just is mm -hmm. what it is. That's football mm -hmm. and that's always going to be football. And you know, I think you know the biggest testament to this Miami team will be next week. How do we come out and play early? Oh, so we can help when we play hard. You know, that, I think that is going to really show and upset oh, everybody else. Hold on one second. You, you know, got some loud music playing. I apologize. I don't know who that is, but yeah, okay, go for it. I'm sorry, Kevin. Oh, Please. you're good. You're good. My biggest, my biggest thing is like after you get beat like that, right? You know, you talk about it a little bit and you end it, right? We're not going to linger with it. We're not going to let it linger all week. And oh, we got beat like that. Okay, great. Let them enjoy that. 
And now let's move on to the next week. You know, now let's see how we come out in the first quarter, how our defense plays. How about a couple three and outs early? How about a couple punts early to our offense and let De'Ara King and Brevin and Will Mallory get going, right? And maybe, maybe even on the offensive side too, they need to get a little run aspect going. I know they tried, right? They tried to get it early. And I also understand completely that when you're down that much, the run game for the most part goes out the window. So, you know, I think, for Miami to establish the run game and just tackle better, right? And it doesn't have anything to do with like, oh, they don't practice tackling drills because we all know they do. Today was just Mm -hmm. a bad tackling day. And I think that's what you chalk it up to. And you come back and you try to do the best you can next week. You know, I think that's really football and that's really life. I got you, man. And and I appreciate that. Let let me do Well, let me say this. Let me ask you this because a lot of people talk about tackling. Here's what I've realized as, as a coach. And you're right. There are some days you just have bad tackling, but that's why you have to harp on all 11 to the ball. Right. So when one man misses, the next man jumps in, jump in, jump in, jump in. And what we saw again, I understand that Duke is a totally different team. I mean, North Carolina here, Duke down here. I get that. But the performance Miami put on so far schematically, defensively, you see people getting to the ball, vicing the ball. You got a, 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 a inside shoulder guy, an outside shoulder guy, and a head up guy vicing this ball. We didn't see that tonight, and, and so it be, it created a lot of one on one tackles. So therefore, in turn, you get a lot of missed tackles, bad tackling, um, and I think that's a schematic deal. And we're gonna get into the gap scheme and some of the power plays, off tackle deals that I've been talking about from the beginning. Uh, and I know you just said this, but I'm going to let you start it off since you are our, our guest. Um, here's my biggest question, right? And I understand not harping on it. But as you get this deep into the season, can you say the previous eight games, is it eight games at this point? Yeah, eight games told this story already? You knew this story, this chapter was going to come? You know, I think in football, I think it's unfair to say that the start of the season you know, tells us or foreshadows what the end of the season brings. You know, I've been around football too long and I've seen too many teams come along at the right time, you know, and start to gel at the right time at the end of one year and then bring that right into the next year. Like, for Mm -hmm. example, LSU last year or two years ago, they lost that bowl. They came back big in that bowl game, right? Joe Burrow got hit hard. He got knocked out. They brought him back. He came back and he won that game. And nobody will ever convince me that that game and that bowl game didn't transition to their national championship year. Like, you'll Mm -hmm. never convince me of that. So so I think that if they can just – like, don't get me wrong. Now, Miami has, what, lost two games now? Mm -hmm. But that's nothing to now say, oh, man, we stunk. Like, you know, you guys are good. You know, you're you're the 10th team in the country. You had a bad game against a team that sometimes has our number. Right. I remember mm-hmm. in 2013, we went to play them on Thursday night. Trey Boston was still one of their safeties and they beat us or no, we beat them late, real late. Uh, Duke Johnson got knocked out and Dallas Crawford really won the game for us. He really ran the ball hard for us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just kind of is what it is. Right. And like that year, we were real hot early. And then we we lost a couple games, you know, Logan Thomas at Virginia Tech, and then we lost to Duke. But then we rallied, right? And I think that's right. what football is about, you know, in my opinion, is what yeah. can you do after a big loss, right? Everybody can do good when you beat Duke by 50. Everybody can be good there and front runners. But what can you do now when a team says, no, Miami, no traditional Miami, you guys have all these guys, we're going to walk in here and we're going to beat you. What are you going to do the next week? You know, you're going to come out, you're going to lay down, you're going to let, you know, I don't know who they play next week, but you're going to let them run for another 500 yards. Right. So now you're going to let Georgia Tech run for 500 or you're going to right. go there in the first three drives, you're going to shut them down on on nine plays, three, three and outs, and you're going to make them punt to De'Ara King and, and Brevin gotcha. Jordan, you know. Yeah, gotcha. So, Balin, let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question because you've been on our show, so you kind of been hearing what we've been saying. And I know one of the biggest things I've always talked about and, and again, we can talk about all aspects, but I've always talked about the gap scheme, perimeter run, off tackle plays has been a nemesis to our defense. And tonight it showed his head. It didn't peek out. It popped out. And so I say that to you. Um, 
showing from from game one as these we went week by week by week by week. Did you do you feel the same way as Kevin, or do you have a different opinion? I couldn't really hear your last part. It kept, it was muffling. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me clear? Got me. I, I, so my last. So my question. I don't know. So my question. I'm gonna go to you then, V12, while I'm there talking to him. Okay, I'm good. All right. Yeah. So my question is. So my question was. The things that we saw happening week in and week out as we've been doing this show. Finally, reared its head to a complete catastrophic meltdown. Do you think that's accurate, or do you take the same approach as as, as Kevin Olson? Yeah, I mean, I take 50-50. You know, I do agree with what Kevin said, but I, I just feel like we – it's just – these are the same habits that we've been doing since week one. It's not like it's been a really surprise. You know, a lot of the games we've been in, it's been comeback victories against subpar opponents. You know, the only games we've dominated are teams that are, are like, like one – or two loss or, or two win programs. You know, we come back Virginia Tech. We, you know, we come back in, in pretty much sixty percent of our football games this year, sitting at eight and one coming into this full. Talk about every week, but you know, it's it's the same story. And you know, at the end of the day, it, I don't feel like we've gotten better. And I think this game has proved that we, you know. We, we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. I got you. So, V12, I'm going to pose the same question to you, and then I'm going I'm to turn it on. Oh, to on your end too. Yeah, it was kind of freezing on you, Balin, for a second. V12, go ahead. I disagree with Kevin and someone with Balin. We saw it coming. I saw it coming. We've been talking about not to this to this level, to this magnitude. I did not see it. 62-point magnitude, No. But we knew one of these days it was going to come. And what it showed today was that our competition was subpar, who we played, and we we somewhat struggled with those teams, and we had to come back. And we played a team who was, like I said in the pregame show, very, very balanced, very, very talented. And it showed tonight. If we can't go out, we just looked on defense extremely slow. Kevin spoke about the tackling. You know, my, my thing is if one person missed a tackle or a few tackles were missed, that's okay. But these dudes were actually trucking guys left and right, bounce off here, spin there. I mean, these guys were not tackling. You you're, you practice tackling. Tackling is hitting and wrapping up, not Amari Carter throwing his body and getting trucked on multiple occasions. That's not tackling. And that's where – through one of the the, um, the the people who opposed the question earlier the, uh, on, on uh, YouTube when they asked about coaching, that's coaching and that's then that's tackling. You have to when a guy is not fulfilling his technique, you got to pull him. You got to coach him on the sideline. And these guys were not tackling. They didn't tackle very well. And partly because the running backs were really, really good running backs. They were shifty and they were powerful. Exactly. And I'm going to say this in in, in turn. I, I kind of agree with you more to V12 is the sense of I'm going to just give a quick analogy, right? Take it to a car. When your engine light go on and you continue to ignore it. Right. You're going to get away with it. For a certain period of time. And then you're going to blow the engine. If you don't go get it checked out and fixed and correct it, you're going to blow the engine. And that's how I see it tonight. We've been talking about, and, and there are a lot of other things that happen, but I'm just speaking for myself specifically. Specifically, I'm not even worried about the pass game, right? I could take 223. But a dude with 300 yards and the other dude with 300, a 200 and something to make 550, I think they had. And it primarily yeah. came off perimeter run, off tackle plays. And we never fixed it. You can't put a band aid on a bullet wound, bro. You're going to bleed out. It's just that simple. And that's how I felt about it because these are the things we talked about. It's not like, bro, North Carolina didn't do anything out of the ordinary except for the little Philly special when they scored a touchdown. Other than that, bro, they played basic day one 
install one, install two, install three football, meaning the first three days of practice, these are the plays they, they didn't do anything super special. They threw the nine route. Nothing special about that. They ran gap scheme. They ran a power off tackle. Nothing that outside zone. There is nothing uh, uh, exotic about that kind of play. You understand? And so I just wanted to put that out there. Let me do this real quick before I move on to the next one. I know I missed him right here. Roland, appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much for the 499. He says every single player better come back for 2020, 2020, uh, 2021. We can't let L's like that. This was a lack of heart and a lack of pride. Hey, I, I agree with you, uh, you know, uh, to a certain extent with that, man. And again, thank you so much for that. And let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and bless you, man, real quick. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for that. Let me see here. Here we go. All right, so here's my here's my deal. Here, here's my next question to you guys. I had a Wait, you had a question we, for your boy. Can we yeah. uh, can we uh, can we respond to that real quick? Sure, go for it. I'm gonna piggyback off what Kevin just told me, and I think I agree with it. Okay, go for it. He said he said it's not a lot. It's a lot. We got a deck of. We got an echo. I guess y'all in the same room, so it's echoing. Go for it. Gotcha. That was me. So I talked to Kevin. We we're just talking. He made a good point. He said, it's not a lack of heart. It's a lack of execution because all week in practice, it's not like they went into this game saying we want to lose. It was the fact that they couldn't execute and did nothing to change what they were doing. In, in turn, they got blown out. I don't think it was a lack mm -hmm. of pride or anything. I think it's just a lack of execution. We just looked flat and no adjustments were, were made defensively at all. Like, I don't even think they went into halftime and watched any film. I mean, it, it even looked even worse. You know, so I just – I don't know if it's a lack of pride. I just think, again, the execution is absolutely horrendous. Yeah, I, I totally agree um, with you with that. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying. So even from a coaching – and I'm not blaming the players. I'm really not blaming the players. I'm holding a, I'm holding the coaches highly accountable. I may make this deal an 80-20 deal, 80% coaches, 20% players. Because like you said, there's no there was no change up. And I don't want to get too coachy on here because I don't know how many of the followers are real coachy. But when you're a spill player, as Phillips was spilling the ball, there was no overlapping linebacker. I saw one time a man popped it, Frierson, number three. He's still looking in the backfield. They have to play off each other. You have to make each other correct. Phillips one time dug up underneath. Boom, Frierson still looking in the backfield. By that time, by the time he looked up, Buddy was gone. And so those are the type of things. And that's that scheme, right? That scheme, that's where the problem I felt has always been. I don't really, I'm not going to blame the players. They can play football. They're at the University of Miami. They were, they are power five recruits, you know, but at any time, if you're not in position to make a play, you're not in position to make a play. So, and here's the deal. It's not like it happened once or twice. Like we always tell you, something has to happen more than two times to become a, a, a pattern. Well, guess what? It happened all game. That means that's a scheme issue. That's not a player being out of position, eyes, you know, he got bad eyes, he's looking bad. That was all game, bro. I think they didn't score but on two possessions, something like that. Uh, uh, real quick, man, I'm just going to drop this in here too, uh, quick, and I'm going to let you uh, respond, Kevin. Uh, Shine Castellino says, we need to opt out the 2021 season, fix some serious fundamental issues, real talk, two words, hopeless and depressed, nothing to look forward to. I think that's a little harsh. I mean, I think we still had a great season. Uh, but with that being said, I'm going to give you a little. Uh, hey, go ahead, Kevin, real quick. I know you said you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, you know, I, I really just piggyback it really off Balin's deal. Like, you, you, did you mute yours? I can hear myself through there. All right. I got you. The, um, it, it, I just find it hard to believe that any college football team has a lack of pride, a lack of effort, and a lack of want to. Like, you'll never convince me that any team all week goes into practice and is like, yeah, we don't really care if we win. We'll travel and we'll go to the hotel and we'll eat dinner and then we'll come home. Like, nah, that's not how it goes, I promise. So it, it, it's not so much a lack of pride or a lack of – 
focus or a lack of want to or effort. It's more mm-hmm. of a lack of execution. And like I said, in football, sometimes that happens, right? And it might be a lack of execution by, like I saw a lot of non-wrapping tackles, like ones that you're trying to blow guys up and they don't get blown up because those, ta- those um, running backs, like V12 said, were low to the ground. They were powerful and they were running. And if you didn't gang them and, and swarm them and arm tackle and not just arm tackle, but wrap them, they weren't going to get tackled. So, you know, I think it was a it was a difference between I think we were more beat schematically than we were just outwilled. In my I, opinion. I, I, and that's where I agree with you. And and like I said, so I, I was giving you when I said what I when I, the, the initial question I, I posed to you was because I know these were things we talk about week in and week out on the show. And I know you weren't on the show, uh, so you probably didn't see it. But I agree with you from a schematic standpoint. We have been talking about this since UAB. I know I have, and then you guys can contest to that. Hey, off tackle, la, 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 we got to fix it. And we finally fixed it, Duke's game, and we went, we reverted back. I got a quick question for you, Kevin. Actually, somebody has one for you. Kiko Hernandez says, Kevin Olsen looks like Greg Olsen. Are they related? Yeah, that's my brother. All right, man. I just want to put that out there. I just want to put that out there. They, they, they banging it in the chats, man. Hey, tell you they they feeling it right now. Uh, real quick, here we go. Let me see here. I'm trying to find. Here we go. This is huge right here, guys. This is huge right here. On oh, with the fifty spot. G Blacken. Hashtag check engine light. I'm loving it. Hearts were two. Uh, hearts were took, and McLeod and Jennings gave up four off tackle lead into the scores, and now replaced in the first quarter. Somebody needs to be fired, and Rumpf better not be the only scapegoat in the attempt to show resolution. I, I totally agree with you, man. And we definitely we're gonna dig into this stuff deep. You know what I mean? If you guys on the show gotta go, I totally understand. But I'm here for the long haul. Let's get it. All right, man. So real quick, let's jump into this part. I'm, I want to jump into this piece of it because we're talking about. Let's just jump into the defense side of it. I don't know where I want to start. Balin, or uh, V12, I'm going to ask you a quick question. I'm going to jump back to you. Uh, V12, DBs. Let's jump into the DB game of it, right? My man Sam Howell was 14 of 19, as we were talking about before we started. Only missed five passes for 223 yards. Threw one touchdown. Scored 62 points, and he only he only threw one touchdown. I know he caught one and ran one, but I'm saying from a quarterback, he only threw one. What do you think from a DB standpoint? How did they play? DBs played, they played subpar. They didn't have to throw the ball much. So they didn't really get, they really didn't get that much work. The plays that I did see were big plays down the field. And we spoke about the the, the number two, who, who was the Belitnikov um, semifinalist. I mean, he, he was pretty much open all day. So the DBs, I don't put a lot of stock in the DBs. They weren't, they were kind of exposed. I mean, they didn't, they, they have their share of blame to go around because the running game was so potent, they weren't tested as much. But when they were tested, there was success down the field and in the middle. So the DBs, you have to you have to blame them to a certain extent. But also up front, the defensive line, they didn't get any pressure on the quarterback. It was it was slim to none. And, and so when he dropped back, he was just scanning the field. He's sometimes checking down to the second and third receivers to find com- some completed passes. So the DBs, they were they were shaky at best. Definitely, man. Real quick, I'm not going to play this every time now. I've just come to realize you guys are, are banging it with the donations, man. So I'm just going to pop it in. No, I'm going to give it to you at the end, and I'm going to probably play one at the end for everybody. Rolling again, he says, I saw no heart fire in the eyes. They were 21-3. They seem to be defeated, waiting for someone to make a play. Lack of execution is due to that, as well as – hold on, I just saw something. Uh, oh, shoot, come on, man. You guys killing the uh, the, 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 the uh, chat room. Here we go. Uh, OG Kane again, $2.67 $2, last year, 8 2 a year later. We're supposed to be world beaters. We did not dominate team yet. We are a microwave dynasty and just think that we should blow everybody out. Be realistic. Progress was made being six and seven last year. 
Uh, I'm going to start off by this, and I'm just going to go around the circle. I, and, Balin, I'm going to go start with you after this. I agree with you, OG Kane. All I'm saying is, back to what I was saying, if you saw something wrong, again, they didn't beat us because I don't think they were more talented. They beat us schematically. The teacher taught the student tonight. Mac Brown taught Manny Diaz tonight, right? And 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 Red La not Red Lashley, uh, uh, Baker, Blake Baker. That's how I feel about it. What do you have to say about that, Baylor? I agree, but uh, I think, uh, gosh, it, it was just there's there was a lot of wrong. But again, at the end of the day, like I do agree that we are a lot better than last year. Obviously, six and seven was was not good, and this year we're eight and two. The only problem is I told you, Coach Hayes, weeks ago when they ranked us at number 10 and didn't move us at all for two weeks without playing a single football game. College football wants Miami to be back. They do. So we beat a Virginia Tech team who is absolutely terrible by one. They put us at number 10 in the country. Why? Because they want Miami to be a top team. But then what does that do? It leaves us to a point where we get exposed like tonight and now everybody hates on Miami and wants to, you know, say they're not back and we need to fire coaches and we need to blah, 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 blah. And I just, it's a false reality. You know, I, I would have been, it would have been much better if Miami was ranked like 20, if they were like 20 or 21, realistically, even being eight and one, you know, being blown out 62 to 26 would be, yeah, it would be bad, but it'd be like, okay, those guys, you know, they have a lot of work to do. But then when you're number 10 in the country and get absolutely embarrassed on national TV, you know, by, you know, get scored on 62 points. You know, when we talk about Sam Howell, right? He threw 200 and what, 26 yards. You know, the reason why he didn't have a bigger game throwing is because they were gashing us. You know, you ever heard of the phrase, don't stop it unless it's broke, you know, or don't fix it. Right, mm -hmm. they were gashing us, so they're scoring on long touchdown runs. Therefore, not enough opportunities for Sam to throw the ball. Why would you throw the ball? And when he did throw the ball, he was very effective, you know. And like you said, it was just deep balls, right, over and over again. But man, they were connecting, and it was great throws and great catches and great catches after the you know runs after the catches. So at the end of the day, you know, Sam Howell had a great game. He scored three touchdowns. He accounted for three touchdowns. He rushed one, he caught one, and he threw one. And that's not accounting the five touchdowns that was on the ground for the other guys. So gotcha. that tells you that he played efficiently and our defense got exposed. The DBs were absolutely horrendous. I think that, the, you know, the drive that really hurt us was when we threw that pick. When we threw the pick, um, when the kid, it looked like w Wiggins almost caught the ball. And then the guy stripped it. And it was actually, in my opinion, pass interference. That was a momentum change because that play was right after they missed the field goal. And he yeah. was beat. So you you yeah. score on that play, we cut it to what fifteen points, and there's still time left in the in the third quarter. You know, the, you just change the football game. But then what totally. do they do four plays later? They gash us and score a touchdown. You know, it's like right. come on. So at the end of the day, you know, Sam Howell played efficiently. You only missed five passes. You still threw two hundred and twenty six yards on a great, you know, supposedly Miami defense, and he accounted for three touchdowns. You know, gotcha. again, he could have probably thrown more touchdowns if those guys weren't running fifty yards downfield and scoring. You know, so. It, it, yeah, we just got outclassed and outplayed tonight. And I, again, I don't think it's a, a heart issue. I think it's an execution, and I do think it's an adjustments issue. And I and I believe, in my opinion, the coaches lost more than the players tonight. There was nothing made, and and, and we just got out schemed. You know, so that's my opinion. To totally agree. Real quick, Darren Boggs, appreciate you with the four ninety nine. So now, Kevin, let me ask you a question uh, about that same thing. Let me go ahead and ask you that same question then, uh, in regards to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an easy thing to say to be a fan and say, oh, we need to hire, we need to fire everybody and bring new people in. Like, okay, but that only works so many times, right? Like, I think it's super easy, no different than the people in the crowd and the fans that the minute the starting quarterback makes a bad play, calls for the backup. They're the same people. You're never going to fix them. And, you know, I think for people just to call out, oh, Manny Diaz and Rhett Lashley, we need to bring in new guys. Well, like, okay, well, like, how many times you guys going to bring in new guys? Like, mm -hmm. okay, you fire, you fire Mark Rick, you bring, in, you bring in Manny Diaz, who was already on the staff, but he was already hired somewhere else, and he comes back, fine. But, like, how many times are you guys going to do that and call for that stuff? Like, I remember at, at – and we were going to play and people would fly those flags over to fire Al Golden. Like, you know, it's just, it, it hurts. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. it hurts as a player that plays for him. It hurts as a player that grew up knowing him when he was at Penn State. You know, Al was more than just my coach. You know, he right. was my friend. He was my, you know, he was a he was a person that I really looked up to. And for somebody to, if, if everybody's first instinct, especially if they don't know the game, is, oh, we just need to fire them and bring in new guys. Like, okay, great. Do that. I agree with you. And then the next year, those guys are still going to call into your show and say, well, we were six and seven. We need to find somebody else. Well, you're only going to run into a dead end at that point. Like, there's only yeah. so many people in the world that can call plays, and there's only so many people in the world that can call them, and I don't think Miami's issue is coaches. I think that people, A, need to get off everybody's back, and I think, B, they need to let the coaches coach, and they just sit in the stands and play, and I think they'll be happier with that result. I got you, man. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, real quick, uh, she put a hit. I believe I caught your super chat. Hey, my people be serious about their super chat, so I think I caught it late. The, hey, it's jumping in here right now, so you trust me. I'm trying to talk, do this, moderate, and read these things at the same time, so give me a second. I'm just a football coach, yeah, and I'm a little just hurt. Like, and just uh, just uh, good news real quick. Florida's yeah. losing, so just give you that. Florida's losing. I heard that real quick. Uh, I guess it's Alakazam, five bucks. I appreciate you, Clemson fan here. Uh, I know how y'all feel. Keep your heads up. I just feel Miami looked the looked – they wasn't there. I guess defense was done in the third. Love the show. Thank you. I appreciate you, Alakazam. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can push this thing down, man, because I'm – All right, here we go. So so let, let's talk about this before I open up because I know the phone line is going to be buzzing. People was already on the thing when I posted it. Um, and I, I think you got a valid point, uh, Kevin, and I'm going to jump to UV12 about this. One thing I know about fans, I always say this short for a fanatic, and the easy answer is always to fire somebody. Right. I get that. You know, uh, as a as, this is all that has always been the answer in sports. A lot of people, these talking heads and I guess I'm a talking head now. Uh, but a lot of talking heads look at the surface of something and not at the root of the problem. Right. So they don't look at the root of the issue. Um, do you feel that somebody needs to be fired? V12. Whether it be a position coach. The coordinator, Manny Diaz, the AD, so any or, or not, it's up to you. That's a tough question, and I, I do believe that we need to not be so quick to call for the firing of of a coach. Blake, this is Blake Baker's first year as a, as as the defensive coordinator, especially with Miami, also Red Lashley. And we do need to give them an opportunity to try to right their wrongs. Here's my concern. How long do we give a Blake Baker to try to rectify the defense? Because my thing is, over the course of the year, my major concern is that the defense has not gotten better over the course of the year. And so where does that where does that put us? Manny Diaz, and I'm glad I'm not the head coach, is going to have a tough job of evaluating Blake Baker and just trying to figure out how in the world a team set a record on us by almost having 800 of total yards. Like, how do you explain that to me? And it's going to be difficult. And so I'm on the fence, but my – to Greg's point, my issue is being able to get better as a defense. And we haven't gotten there. And how long will it take? We may not have this time where the offense is going to be as efficient as they've been this year. To be quite honest, we've actually had a heck of an offensive year. Everyone pretty much remained healthy outside of COVID and outside of Brevin Jordan. Are we going to have a year like that next year again? We don't know. So I don't want to say fire your coach is still kind of early, but you got to do some 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 soul searching for Manny Diaz to figure out what needs to be done because the defense for right now is definitely uh, the short the short thumb for this, this Hurricanes team. Got you. Now, Baylor, let me ask you this because you're in the coaching realm and you know we all have been in the games. I done got my behind shellac too. You know, just what it is. I can talk all I want. But we all been on that sideline. We've all gotten our behind kick, uh, and that's what it is. It's just part of the game. Uh, he, so I've always, from a coach, I'm always look from a coach perspective. 
I'm, it's hard for me to call for somebody's job. It really is, unless it is just blatant. But here's the difference in, in college football, right? College football, there's a lot of outside pressures, right? Once the fans start rolling, the fans start talking to the boosters, in essence, right? Because these boosters start getting on these bobbleheads, right? The, the talking head shows, and they, oh, fire this guy, fire that guy. Well, most of these boosters don't know football like that. They are fans with a bunch of money. And so now they're going to the AD or the president or whomever or the board of trustees and saying, hey, you need to fire this person, blah, blah, blah. Now that pressure comes down. And as we all know, sugar, honey, iced tea rolls downhill. And so with that being said, what happens is I believe Manny Diaz is going to have to fire somebody to save face. I just believe that in my heart. Balin, what do you think about that in regards to do you think Manny's going to have to or do you believe somebody should be fired? Part two of that question is, if not, do you think that Manny Diaz needs to fire somebody in order to save face for the season? I'm in over to sleep, man. Sorry. You on that can you? This. No, I was watching this play by Florida. They just picked, or uh, LSU just picked it off and they're reviewing it. It looks like ESPN top play. Else you got to pick, so we're happy. But uh, ask, ask that question. Sorry. Hold up, man. I got to hit you with one of these. Though. I'm sorry. So my question was, do you feel that somebody needs to be fired just as Balin looking at this? Or And part two is if you don't think somebody needs to be fired, do you believe that Manny Diaz will receive so much pressure from the higher ups that he needs to fire somebody? And as somebody put in the comment section, say a Mike Rump being a scapegoat as to what's going on. You know, that's a good question, but um, I don't think anybody needs to be fired this year. I think we give it one more. Guys, we're eight and two. At the end of the day, yeah, we got embarrassed bad, and we've really not made any adjustments defensively. We keep talking about the same thing over and over again, week in and week out, but I don't think it's the time to fire, you know, anybody right now. And I do believe next year, you know, halfway through the season, if we're like, you know, a little over 500 or we're not getting any better, I think, you know, Manny becomes on the hot seat and he might potentially lose his job. But right now I don't feel like that's the best thing to do. I do feel like Manny Diaz really needs to tell Baker to take a back seat and him take over defense. Cause that's when I believe we were one of the top defenses consistently. And, and this would have never happened. I don't believe if he was full reign of that defense, but at the end of the day, how can I say that when he's still on the sideline and he, and ultimately he's the head coach, but um, I just don't think right now being eight and two and was number 10 in the country still, you know, have an opportunity to play in a big time bowl game. I don't think now if we get beat again in a bowl game where we should not be losing to an opponent, you know, then, yeah, we have some question marks in the offseason at certain position coaches, but I don't think the head, like the the OC or DC even, or, or, or the head coach should be in a position to get fired as of right now, unless we get embarrassed in a bowl game. I, I got you. Now, let me, I'm going to pose a question to the viewers and listeners. Um, everybody's saying fire Blake Baker. I mean, the comment section is jump. I can't even read it fast enough, I'm be honest with you. But here's what my question I pose to you. Who, do, who are we replacing it with? See, we want to see. Here's my thing is if you're going to bring up a problem, you also have to bring up a solution. So now my question to you is if we're if we are as fans smart enough to say fire this guy, we should also have done our homework enough to say who we're going to bring in. So I'm posing this to the to the viewers. Who do we bring in? I love to pop it up on the thing. Let's talk about it. I'm going to open up the phone lines in a second. You more than welcome to call in and say why you feel that way. Uh, real quick, Reggie says. 550 yards rushing in one game and no firing. Mac Brown fired Manny when he was at Texas and defense was trash. That is true. Mac Brown did fire Manny Diaz after they that They also BYU weren't 8-2 and, and number 10 in the country that's either. That's true. And that's true. That's why it's a lot of – that's why there is a lot of factors that go into this, man. I like this one. I like this one now. I like this one. Huh? Hi, Coach Hayes. That's what I'm talking about. Can't argue Hi, that Coach one. Hayes. I love it, man. Hey, Kevin, what you think about that, man? You, you're an alumni. What, what you think, man? Coach, I'm good with that. <laughs> Coach, if you're back in there. Hey, I'm if in. I got to put, if the players got my back, let's go, man. We start a petition, man. Y'all meet me at Green Tree, man. We're going to stand in front Green of that with signs, man. As long as you hire Kevin as the OC and me as a quarterback coach, we're good. 
Here we go, man. Look, Lakers all day. Hey, what's up with you, Lakers all day? Hi, Coach Hayes. I'm look here, man. I need a job, man. You too fun, but it ain't paying the bills. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna put this on here. Uh, what's up, Cuz? Is my uh, Charlie Strong needs a job? We would lose a, in a bowl game. Well, let me ask you this, and I've always went back to this. And, and Kevin, I'm gonna go to you about this because I, I don't know how much you knew from a player standpoint, but a kid, you guys hear more than we do. Um. Here's the problem when you try to bring these high-profile guys into this game. You got to pay them. You have to pay them. And right now, SEC, uh, Big Ten, Pac-12 has messed up the bell curve for paying coaches when it comes to this stuff because they're paying coaches $1.8 million. Uh, Brent, Brett Venerable is making $2.4 million. Don Brown in Michigan is making $1.8 million. I mean, I don't think we can pay. I don't – I. I Bro, I would put my life on the line. My man ain't even making eight hundred thousand. Blake Baker, he ain't even probably making six hundred thousand. He may not make five hundred thousand at Miami. So, Kevin, let me ask you a question. Do you think that's a valid point so far as the uh, the payment? See, we want these high profile guys, but we got to bring out these high profile dollars. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a very valid point. You know, I think, like you said, those guys are are so sought after like Brent Venables you brought up, for example, like he cost that much because he proved that he should cost that much. Like, you know, and those guys, there's, they're a dime. A do you don't have a bunch. They're not a dime a dozen, you know? So I think, like you said, if you're a person that brings up problems and has no type of solution, then that's the problem. So, you know, I think I think Manny Diaz, when he was calling the defense, was as good as a defensive coordinator as 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 there is around. You know, like and and just because he's the defensive coordinator and guys don't tackle, or that other guy that you mentioned was the defensive coordinator, I don't know his name, and they don't tackle doesn't necessarily mean his scheme is bad. Like mm -hmm. I saw three, four guys around those those North Carolina running backs and they don't go down. Like, you mm -hmm. can't convince me that's a Manny Diaz issue. It's not. Mm -hmm. Like, no mm -hmm. different than it's not a Rhett Lashley issue if you throw a guy the ball and he drops it. That's not a, co it's not a coordinator issue. That's right. Sometimes that happens. We're all humans. You know, and sometimes that happens. But I think it's super fair to play the, like you said, that the, those SEC schools with those big budgets are really, really – making the curve super high for those top level defensive <laughs> coordinators, offensive coordinators, head coaches. Yeah. hundred percent. Gotcha, man. I appreciate it real quick. Dave sold you $10. I appreciate you, man. It says fire Blake Baker tonight. Okay. We're going to find out, man. Trust me. We'll see. Now, I don't think anybody in my opinion is going to get fired before the bowl game. I don't know what bowl we may be in. I don't know what bowls are still going to go on based on the COVID pandemic. I have not a clue. Um, you know, hopefully we're not in the toilet bowl, which I doubt. Hopefully we get a, a decent opponent. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, like I said, I'm still hurt about it. Uh, V12, let me ask you this, man. You've been, been kind of quiet on it, man. Linebacker play. Let's get into that. Your boy, and I'm, I'm, I know Baylor, I, that's why I'm going to leave him last because he's going to talk about it. So, Baylor, you're going to be last on this one. Linebacker play, and your boy comes back in tonight, LB McLeod. All right. Uh, Talk to me, man. Well, Kevin just made a point about coaches can only put the coaches, um, put the players on the field. The coaches can't force the players to tackle. That of which LB McLeod, as Baylor likes to call him, did not do tonight as well. We do have a glaring, glaring hole in the linebacker department. And that's particularly why we were gassed tonight and why North Carolina was setting records on us tonight. Javante Williams goes down as the most, has the most touchdowns in North Carolina history on a day in Carroll City, Carroll City, Florida. That is unheard of. And then you have a team set another record. Again, I said to get the team set another record, 780 total yards, which of which 500 and something yards were on the run game, we are not a very good team from a, a linebacker perspective. Our linebackers are very, 
They seem to be a, always a step behind. They're very delayed. To me, it also seemed as though they were unable to diagnose the plays quickly. It, it, they're not getting, getting out of their stances very fast, taking a false step back instead of trying to move forward. So it was all bad from a linebacker perspective. It's it's hard for them, for me, and this is where the coaching comes in. They're not – they don't – appear to be students of the game an astute linebacking core. They can't, they can't diagnose the plays there. It's just tough for them to grasp what's going on. And what really, really made me think about it was because guys, if you just focus, they're running the same plays left and right. They ran the same five plays. You said it coach Hayes for the most part, Guard pull, perimeter plays, the whole entire game. And we were unable to diagnose it and stop it. And the last thing, as a team, we were it was hard for – they blocked very well. North Carolina blocked very well. It was hard for them to get off the block. They, were, they had difficulty shutting blocks and making tackles. So if Blake Baker does keep his job, it's going to be interesting to see – what he does at the linebacker position. And the sad part about it, I don't know the next man up who that's going to be because even when they brought in some of the second team players, they seem to have issues with tackling and diagnosing the play. So we need our talent pool has to get better because I do believe that North Carolina, even on, on offense, have, have superior running backs and their wide receiver is superior as well. And that that's the problem that – we couldn't contain them. We hadn't seen a team a, a, a team outside of Clemson that had that much talent, and and it showed tonight. And we can't we can't go. Although we've had progress, we can't keep going on and saying, "Yeah, we're eight and two. But at the end of the day, even Balin said it all year. We played to the level of competition of those schools who should have beat a long time ago, and now we get a team who's complete on the level of a Clemson almost. And we they put up sixty two points on us. I just think it's. It's hard for me to swallow. It's a tough pill for me to swallow at this particular point in time in the season. Gotcha. I see Kevin took off right quick. So, Bale, I'm going to let you go, and then I'm going to finish it out. Go for it. No, he's still here. Oh, okay. He's right here. All right, good. I'm going to let Kevin go first because you gonna, I know you're going to be a little long-winded when it come to your boy McLeod, man. So, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. When Talking about linebacker play, right? And especially you being from behind center, you get a chance to see those guys from the other side of the line, right? And you say, okay, you may make certain checks based on this, based on that, looking at those type of deals, based right. on three techniques, so forth, so on. Miami's linebacker play. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And I think the more I watched the game, I just felt like they weren't there. Like they were out of position or the scheme and the front and the coverage – made them add a position to stop those inside zones, to stop counter gap and to stop that kind of stuff. I, I just, a lot of their gashes weren't running through the tackles. Like we've talked about previously, a lot of their gashes were like, nobody was even there. The defensive end is running up the field. The guards kicking them out and the tackles wrapping and they're through and they're off to the races you know, so I, I, a lot of the times I'm, I was sitting here watching the game with Balin and another one of our buddies, and, and I'm saying, where are the backers? Like, where are they? Where's the nickel? Where's the two inside backers? Where's your safeties and your run support? Or whatever coverage it is, you either have your corners or your safeties as the run support. Where are they? Like, they can't always go for 30 before they're touched. And I think that was a glaring hole, the nickel. If they're playing, I think they're playing some type of four, two, five. So that nickel, whoever that is, and the two inside backers were pretty much non-existent today. Got you. I appreciate you, Baylor. Talk to us, man. I'll tell you okay. exactly hey, keep who hey, one of those hey. two inside backers are. Hold on, do me a favor. His name, you, his name is keep Elder it under, McLeod. I understand. Can you do me a favor? Keep this under thirty minutes, please. <laughs> I'll just tease. I'll make it short it. and sweet. <laughs> I almost make it very quick. Yeah, I almost don't want to say nothing because that's exactly how they played. They didn't play anything. Like it was like you could just take those two players off the field and and get the same exact production. 
absolutely horrifying. If anybody's going to get fired, those guys get their scholarships taken away. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if you're LB McLeod and was a projected top three draft pick and, or top three um, three round draft pick. You are absolutely horrifying. If anything, you have become the example of what not to do as someone who had who had a high status. You've completely sold the bag. Everybody has sold the bag in the linebacker position. Today was absolute and you know who else you know who else hurt themselves in the case to even be looked at as a free agent? Carter. If you guys saw Carter's angles on how he was coming down the run, it looked like he should have never been at safety. If anything, the fact that he wants to go blow a head off, how about you put him at back or take McLeod off the dang uh, field and see what he does back there? Because at the end of the day, you need run-fit linebackers. Either you fit or you get run on, and that's exactly what happened today. They got run all over. And like Kevin just yeah. mentioned, bro, those guys were 30 yards downfield before even making a move on a safety. One run, right. the guy went 30 yards downfield and trucked our safety and kept going. Like, it was just so bad. But, yeah. but keeping the main thing the main thing, our linebacker play is the reason why we can't stop the run and we can't stop it consistently. I mean, dude, I literally saw McLeod in one tackle, and that was on second and goal, or actually no, it was third and goal on the one yard line, and, and or sorry, excuse me, third and one on the two yard line, about to get a first down, and he literally grabbed the guy from behind and thought he stopped him in his first and goal. Like, dude, you did absolutely nothing. Don't go out there and get all hype and you do nothing. Like, it's just unbelievable and i don't think you know i whoever our linebacker position coach when i talked about earlier about people getting fired he might be one of them and again he can he can call the right things you know but and the players still have to play but at the end of the day you're putting these guys out there and you know they can't make it happen i don't care what we've seen i don't care if his size i don't care it's not good and it's just absolutely horrifying I, I agree with you. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say two things, and I'm going to go ahead to the next level. Looks like we're slowing down here. All right, everything moving. All right, good. All right, real quick, I'm going to say this, too, about linebackers. I saw a lot of linebackers undercutting, pulling guards. I saw a lot of linebackers undercutting the chip blocks, right? So when the guard center is working the nose, work like uh, climbing, they're going underneath that. And I saw that repeatedly. But here's where I, I guess where my dilemma is when it comes to it from a coaching standpoint. And I always say this, guys, once the bar goes up, it never goes down. And they didn't do that against Clemson. And I mean, I'm sorry, against Duke. And the problem is, I understand Duke was trash. I get it. But that still doesn't change your philosophy or your scheme on how you play something. So what now this week all of a sudden changes? That's the part I'm having an issue with, right? Because. You go again, and maybe it was easier. Maybe they were just a little bit faster than maybe those offensive linemen. They could just scrape across and didn't have to fight that guy. Maybe that was the deal. I don't know. But that's the part I'm having. Seven days ago, seven days ago, you basically did it perfect. Seven days later, you look like seven weeks ago. And that's my that's my issue when it comes to that, when it comes to linebacker play. Real quick, I want to say there's a lot of people in the comments section, excuse me, have been saying Michael Barrow for defensive coordinator. Okay, I'm going to just say this. And this is where sometimes as fans, we get a little crazy. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. See, sometimes we get caught up with names, and I get that. People want to rip this person, that coach, this, that. But Michael Barrow played the position. Yes, he did. But he has never been a coordinator. He was the linebacker coach, but he was never the coordinator. So now we're going to get rid of this guy, which is fine. Let's get rid of him. Let's, let's cancel Blake Baker. But we're saying bring in my, a lot of people, not just a few, a lot of people in here putting in Michael Barrow, which I like Michael Barrow. I know him, dealt with him with recruiting, had many coaching talks with him. I think he's a great coach. But we want to take a guy that has never been a coordinator, and he's out the game a little bit, a couple years, I guess. I don't know what he's doing now. And we want to make him the coordinator because of the name. Let's see how that works out for us. You understand what I'm saying? I don't think that's fair. Me personally, I don't think that's fair. Real quick before I jump this thing on, and I want to get your guys' opinion about it. Chug Mo Beer. Hold on. Cane juice. 
Hello, Coach Hayes. Coach Diaz needs to fire the entire defensive staff clean house. There is no way to, you can justify this disaster. This is why we lose recruits all the time. Fire the defensive staff now. I hear you. You're talking as a fan. We're talking as emotion. I'm. It's hard for me to call for a coach job, and we eight and two, bro. It's hard. Now we were two and eight. <laughs> Listen, I'd have gave myself a twenty dollars super chat just to type that in there. You know what I'm saying? So that's just. I I, I understand. It's just tough for me, man, right now. Um, real quick, Coach Higg says, if eight and two is a disaster, I want to be in a disaster. I heard that, Coach Higg. I heard that, man. Um. So let me ask you a question. You'll take yeah. eight and two any day with a drumming like this every season? You'll be okay with eight and two with, with a drumming like this every season? No, but <laughs> no, 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 no. You're right. But guess what? Okay. But guess what? But No, but here's the difference. I, if I had to take a choice of two and eight and six of those eight were drummings, like Florida State's taking right now, I'll take my, I'll take my eight and two with a one, with a one butt whooping. I'm just being honest, dog. What, what do y'all say? One hundred percent. Think about think about all I know just, is, just, just think about Mike Norville right now at Florida State. He probably bang his head against the wall every day he goes home, saying, "Why in the world did I take this job?" Sure, Kevin. Someone was thinking the same thing until he got fired after a seventy-seven to seven whoop, whooping today. I heard that. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Kevin. Talk to us. Yeah, I mean, I just don't feel like eight and two is any is any reason to fire anybody or any reason to get upset or anything. Like, I don't think anybody preseason thought Miami was national championship playoff good. So, like, why is everybody all mad about eight and two? Like, nobody preseason was thinking, oh, Miami's back to national championship status. I mean, if they did, then they were probably a little ignorant and a little biased. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm gonna say this. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Kev. I'm sorry. No, you're good. And, you know, I just don't think that eight and two is something to scoff at. I think there is 75% of the country that wishes they were eight and two. So I just don't buy that. And again, I've been around a lot of football and I just don't buy that train of thought. I think the argument was no, what B12 said is, 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 is do we go eight and two and get blown mute yourself, out? Mute yourself, Kevin. Mute yourself, Kevin. Right, that's the the mm. thing is. Do, would you mind going eight and two, getting blown out once every yeah, single year? Bad. I would. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't rank as top ten until we feel until we've proven we're top ten in the country. But at the end of the day, I don't mind seeing eight and two and getting blown out by a great UNC team who was once ranked number five in the country. Yeah, I do feel like that was overrated. But at the end of the day, they they are who they are, and and we aren't where we thought we should be. Um, but being eight and two compared to six and seven last year, losing to FIU and Louisiana Tech, you know, it's a big jump. So I don't mind taking a little, you know, humbling pie, you know, and, and letting college football know, hey, we're not back like you guys want us to be. But until we've proven ourselves, man, I'd love to go eight and two with the schedule we have and beat some of the quality opponents like a, you know, historically good Virginia Tech team um, and, and, you know, and, and Louisville, right? on the road so in Florida State in a butt whipping I mean that was my win I, we could have lost every game this season and beating FSU by that much I mean that's just a win for me but that's just a biased opinion but uh, going back to the whole record I think 8 2 is, is something that we should hold our hats up I just wish we didn't lose in the way we did tonight but at the end of the day I would take this much rather than what I had to witness all last year right so so here's what my question is and somebody just put it here in the in the thing um, and I think this is the real issue tonight, right? It's not the fact that we lost the game. It's the fact of how we lost the game. If this game would have been 34 to 30, if this game would have been what the, what the prediction says up here, three point game, we, I think people would be not happy, but satisfied, right? People would be okay with it in the sense of, you know what? North Carolina just had our number. We just couldn't get over the hump, but to take a, 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 a beating like this, I mean, literally from the second drive until they decide to take a knee and walk off the, our field. I think that's what the emotional piece of here it is right here. Oh no, I'm sorry, but it was Kiki, Kiko Hernandez that wrote it. I can't find it because these things are jumping, man. But uh, also do this for me real quick while we're talking about that. Oh, here you go. Uh, Dave Soldier, hit that like button. Hit the like button, man. Get this thing going. Hit the subscribe button for me. Let's make this thing go. And I just saw, here we go. So Kiko says we're mad because we lost 
the loss was a beat down, but naked. You're 100 percent correct. And I think that's the that is the biggest issue is that we will build so far up here with it. With being eight and one, turning this season around from losing to a FIU last year, losing to a La Tech, those type of things. And then you come back and you. Bro, you dropped 62. Somebody dropped 62 on us. And I think that's what's that's what hurts more than the loss was the butt whipping, if, if that makes sense. You know it what makes, I'm saying? It makes total sense because early in the season, the rhetoric was, oh, we lost to a clearly a better Clemson team who was number one in the country. They were more talented than University of Miami. And we went through the season playing teams that, again, we thought were subpar talent-wise to the University of Miami. Now we get to the end of the season, and now we're saying, okay, here's the litmus test. We have a North Carolina team was well-balanced, very talented. How do we stack up? How do we compete with the North Carolina team? And to, 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 the, to the point of the person who left the, the, um, the comment, we didn't stack up very well. And that's one of the most disappointing pointing type of feelings you get from watching the UM team, this UM team all season is that when we right. get down to it and we play someone who is competitive, we can't beat them. We can't even, we're not even competing with a team on that level. And that's most, mostly disappointing because we went through this whole season thinking that, you know, Clemson was so much better than we get to North Carolina who appears to be just as good as Clemson because they, they beat us worse than Clemson did. Got you, man. I appreciate it. Real quick, rolling again. Honestly, Keith Manny is head coach. He has improved his team by light years compared to last year. Evaluate after the bowl game. Improve on 2020, man. Thank you so much for that. Before I even yeah, did, I was that's actually, good. Yeah, I agree with that. And I because Manny has not, he has done a good job. But here it is, man. I didn't even get a chance to put it up yet. The phone lines, we're gonna open it up. I was gonna open it up at the hour mark for any of my guests, just being on it. If you gotta go, just let me know, man. I totally understand. And uh, we're going to open up the phone lines. And I'm just going to answer questions. You guys are more than answer questions. If you want to pose a question to one of the guests, you're more than welcome. I only have one request. One. Please just don't curse. You can show us your love, show us your hate. I understand. We're here to take it. We got big shoulders. You understand what I'm saying? But all I'm saying is just go ahead and, and respect that piece. Call or talk to us. Let me know if you guys can hear them. Call or talk to us. Let us know where you're from. You're loving us or hating us. What's up, Coach? I'm from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a Bama fan, but I love y'all panel. I love the way you break down tape. I don't hear break down players. And I love the way y'all talk about the game from another viewpoint, but that's why I watch. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, so I wanted to say I'm a Bama fan. So you were talking about Charlie Strong, and I was saying that I believe that Nick hired so many analysts because he know the coach is going to leave, so he stopped following until he need him. And I was wondering how can Miami keep more of their high recruits, like wide receiver recruits? How can y'all keep them in the, you know, coming to the school instead of leaving out going to different schools? All right, man. I appreciate it, man. What's your name again? Kurt. Kurt, man. I appreciate you calling in. I'm definitely going to answer that right now, man. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, now. All right. So first question was, he was talking about Nick Saban. I don't know if you guys could you guys hear that clearly. You couldn't hear you couldn't hear it, Kevin. I heard the last half. Okay, well you heard it, V twelve, right? I'll repeat it. What he said was he what he said was how does Nick Saban he stockpiles these guys because he knows that typically his coordinators will venture off onto new jobs and things so forth and so on. I personally have a very quick question, a quick answer to that, and I would love for Kevin being recruited by UL to answer the second part of that question. I'll, I'll pose it to you. The very first question to you, Kurt, man, money. He can hire all these defensive analysts are usually former head coaches. All They can pay these guys. They paying Charlie Strong probably 200 150 just to keep him around because he's out of a job right now. Who, who gets fired and makes 150 on the side to break down film and give the coordinator some suggestions? We can't afford to do that. I talked about that in a previous show. So that's how Nick Saban does it. They have the money. These are state institutions. They can do that. Nick Saban is, is paid more than the president of the university. He's the highest paid uh, 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 state official in the state of Alabama. He gets paid more than the governor. He gets paid more than all these people. They can do it. Alabama breaks $100 million a year 
What is two hundred thousand dollars to win a game? Nothing. Nothing. Peanut. They make that on hot dogs on a Saturday. So that's the first part. Kevin, here's the second piece. He was asking about the top receivers and maybe even some of the top players in the state of Florida. How do we keep them from leaving our state line going on to other programs like Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, so forth and so on? How does Miami turn that around? Right. And, you know, I think the biggest thing is that is just to show that not just that you're winning, but you're building that culture again. You know, because I know the biggest thing to me when I came out of high school was that I could be a part of bringing the U back, back to where I watched my brother play, back to when we had Willis McGahee and Frank Gore and Willie Williams and all those guys that I watched play right before Greg got there and Kellen Winslow and all those guys, Jeremy Shockey and, and Andre Johnson. And, you know, those guys all came to Miami, though, because they knew what Miami was. And they knew that every year they were going to have a chance to compete for the for an ACC title or right. whatever it was then, and a national championship. It was the Big East or ACC still or whatever it was, but whatever. And I think that is going to come. Like I think that at least from the stuff I see, they're starting to keep some of those big name guys around South Florida, unless I'm wrong. But I've seen a couple things where not all of them, but I think a couple guys stay there, right. and they're like, "Yeah, I'm going to bring the U back." And that's the same thing that I said. You know, I watched them play and it gave me goosebumps. I want to go there and bring them back to what they were. And I think they're close. I really do. I think that they're one or two recruiting classes away from being like, okay, now we can say the U is back. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, real quick, um, uh, we got a caller and let me get him through and then I will answer that. Like I said, when these calls come in, I know everybody wants to get a part of maybe an answer. So if we call, talk about something else, just simply say, hey, man, I want to talk about this right quick, but you got a point to make. Caller, talk to us. Give us your name, where you're calling from. You're loving or hating these canes. Yeah, I'm always going to love the cane because I'm a diehard cane, but I am I was so frustrated. I'm calling out of Fort Myers, Florida, a little Pakistan. Uh, this is Mike Lyra from Strict Mike Lyra. Entertainment. <laughs> and uh yeah, this is my live. Hey, uh, I'm just, I'm just the coaching. The coaching suck. We, 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 we gonna, we gonna call it how it is. We gonna call it how it is. We gonna, we gonna. My understanding is, I, I just want to know from all four of you guys how we did not make any change ups during the middle of the game. Or also, why don't we have any kind of goal line offense to get us a fourth down and one? And also, <clears throat> how come we run the same kind of offense similar to North Carolina, but they can open up holes for us to run, for them to run, but we can't open up holes for our running backs to run, and we run the same offense? Third, how come we have a senior in high school taking away a ball from a junior, he got, well, he walled up. He, he, he don't even wear a mouthpiece. He ran the, the Ocho Cinco grill, and he out there allowing a high schooler to take the ball from him. It's just, we don't have no strong running game. We don't even have players that know how to tackle. Mm -hmm. Like, we were talking about this last year when we used to watch on, um, you know, I'm not going to drop, drop name drops, but when, when we when we was on Alonzo one two one nine, we talked about the tackling. You know, mm -hmm. we talked about the linebackers. I want to know why we're not recruiting these players like a Philip Buchanan or a, a Mike Rump. You know, these players that 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 lock down uh, other offensive uh, star power receivers. We don't have linebackers. We don't, we don't, we, we're not having a carousel of linebackers. We, our offensive play calling, uh, looks, uh, minuscule. Uh, we, we, we don't call the right plays. We don't, we don't have no misdirection play. We, I seen one misdirection play when Mike Harley scored in the end zone. Like, right. our, our offense is, is, we talk about how we eight and two. Our expectation level is high for Miami Hurricanes. Gotcha. Hey, well, well like I said, man, what's your name again? I, I, I missed it. This is Mike Lyra, man. Mike Lyra. Oh. Oh. 
I missed that, man. My bad. I apologize, Mike. Man, but like I said, you got you got a lot of questions in there, so we're gonna break it down. I'm gonna get everybody get an opportunity to give an answer, man. But you, I, I think you're on to something. You're right. Uh, I'm gonna just say this when it comes to recruiting because I break a lot of these films down. And I'm gonna let the other guests answer these questions. I'm gonna say this: we are going after them. We are. But I'm telling you now, this is a microwave generation. Everybody's looking for the, the big three letters, NFL, right? Everybody wants to go to a winning program. Everybody wants to go to the Ohio State, the Alabama, the Clemson, the Florida now, which is, is actually killing us from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, that's where the top players are going. And I've said this before, we're not getting tier one players anymore out of our out of our city. We may get one or two, but we're not getting the, like, like Kevin brought up, we're not think about this. We're not getting the Andre Johnson. We're not yeah. getting it. We're not getting the Santana Moss. We're not we're getting not. The, the, the big time players. Just think about that. I've always said this, and I mean, don't no disrespect. I'm gonna let you go and let these guys answer. K Ken Dorsey, I've said this a hundred times, and, and I want you to test this too, Kevin. Ken Dorsey will go down as one of the best Miami Hurricanes ever, but the least yeah. talent, least talented, and I mean athletically in the huddle. So let me explain right. that real quick. He looks to his left, Andre Johnson, Santana Moss, Reggie Wayne, Kellen Winslow, Jeremy Shockey in the backfield, uh, Clinton Portis, McGahee, uh, uh, right. uh, a, a young Frank Gore. Mm -hmm. all, these, all these guys are pro bowlers, bro. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Kent Dorsey, to his credit, which I thought he was a great hurricane, but it didn't translate into the league. He was very cerebral. He, didn't, he, he did what he was supposed to do, control the thing, but here's what happened. How did that translate to the league? It didn't, which was fine. He was a great player. So, man, I appreciate you, Mike, for calling in. Man, I'm going to let the guys answer your question. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, Kevin, real quick, man, talk to us. Did you hear his question? Yeah, I heard it a, yeah, I heard it a, little, I heard bit. It a little bit. Can you, can you rephrase, it? rephrase it? I kept kind of breaking up a little bit. All right. So, he was talking about what, what he, he had a bunch to say. He had a right, bunch I heard to say. It. But uh, um, he was talking about um, – Keeping the players we were talking about in state, right? right? And they were talking about scheme, and we see the things going on, making adjustments. So a lot of things that we talked about. So that's what, what Mike was really right. trying to say. Yeah, and I heard him say that the offenses were similar. I think that's a super valid point. And, you know, I would I would categorize those as the spread, you know, spread horizontal, vertical passing game, inside, outside zone. They got a little counter gap in there. You know, so – I, to be honest, I think the biggest glaring deal was North Carolina's got an NFL linebacker playing at Mike and Miami didn't. You know, I think that is the biggest deal. You know, that kid, that kid, um, Chaz Surratt played quarterback right around where I coach high school football, where I'm the OC at. He played like 20 minutes for me. Him and his brother won the title. They won this. And that guy's a hell of a player. And I think him being in the middle for them – makes a big difference. I heard that he had like 115 tackles last year. Like that's, if you have 115 tackles, you're like a guy. You're not just, you know, a, a college middle linebacker. You're like the guy. And I think that like we talked about the linebacking core and that stuff was the biggest glaring weakness. I think the t defensive lines were similar. You know, they're going to eat up blocks. You know, they're not going to get driven off the ball much. You know, they're going to play hard, but it's really up to the linebackers now in this college game to free themselves up and make some plays. And I think I, just from watching, I saw Chaz Surratt on a lot more tackles than I did Miami's middle backer. Definitely, man. Real quick, V uh, V12, what, what do you say to what the caller had to say? Anything you want to respond to? Yeah, i like to respond to, I could take two of Mike Lowry's questions. He spoke one about the... Uh, our inability to get to have a goal line offense. I think he's referring to the to the fourth down play in which the running back got stuffed, and that actually, to Greg's point, was one of the key turn, turning points in the game. Kevin. Is, on, on Kevin, sorry, Kevin's point to um, where where they stopped us in the game. It stopped to that, that that particular point in time in the game was very. Critical. They stopped us on four down. And I think they went in and they scored. What I think happened on that play was we tend to go so fast, and we didn't. We try to catch them not being set, and I think it backfired. Right. I would right. have liked for Lastly, at that particular point in time, to bring in a jumbo package, 
and run a strong, you know, stretch play or use the Eric King's legs because he was already pretty much in a rhythm by that time in the game and pick up the first down. So I don't, we didn't see that on that fourth down. And then to, to the second point was another pivotal point in the game. D. Wiggins, he's pretty much open. D. Eric kind of underthrew him, but the cornerback wrestled the ball away from D. Wiggins. Now that was that was a play in which all wide receiver coaches would probably would have thrown the clipboard and thrown their hat. That play should not have happened. We talk about spirit and we talk about fight. That wouldn't have been an Andre Johnson. That wouldn't have been a Reggie Wayne. That wouldn't have been a Santana Moth. That wouldn't have been a, a, a Kevin Beard. That wouldn't have been a Roscoe Parrish. They would have come down with that with that football. And that right. would change the complexion of the game because we were pretty much on a roll. We could have cut into the lead. So I want to address those two points from Mike Lowry. Got you. Real quick, I got a call in. So, Baylor, go ahead and give us your point. you on line waiting. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, I can piggyback on all of them. And, you know, our linebacker play is absolutely horrendous. And we could keep talking about that all day. And I'm kind of beating a dead horse. But we got beaten <laughs> like a dead horse today. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, every day we, we got to – huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the way, Florida's losing still. So, this is an update. Um, but, yeah, man, I'm just going to piggyback on those guys. You know, it, we can't just keep saying the same thing over and over again. We saw what happened tonight, and it was right. pretty bad. And coaching needs to get better. But at the end of the day, the players still have to perform. And I love when he said that the, there are similar styles in offense. I think that's very good. I think Phil Longo uh, is a great coordinator. And I, and I, and I feel mm -hmm. that Rhett Lashley has shown himself to be good at times. I would like to see that more consistently. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we kind of run that same spread RPO action and, 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 you know, they just ran it to perfection almost. And we not even close, you know, so, all right. And, and I will tell you the biggest difference in my opinion, besides the linebacker play is the trenches. I think the offensive line for us is, is not even close to where it is compared to other teams that we play. And the reason why we can't gash, because we just said, hey, let's compare offenses. Yeah, they can have a similar style of play calling, but if your offensive line can't block, you, there's no shot. I don't care who you are. So our offensive yeah. line is, I would say, if not – if not even, but worse than our linebacker play. Our offensive line is probably the worst in college football, in my opinion. There was way too many third and longs. I think Derek took too many sacks t today. It was just bad. We couldn't get any push up front. Like it just that's the biggest difference between the two offenses is our offensive line play in the trenches. And we just got bullied, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, you 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 get a better O line and better linebacker play. We're in that football game, but we didn't have either. So that's what the results are, 26 to 62 below out. There you go. Well, real quick, I got to call in, man. You, great points by everybody, man. Call or talk to us, man. Give us your name, where you're calling from. You're hating the love of these Canes. Oh, well, you know, I always love the Canes. My name is Collis. I'm calling away from right. Brooklyn, New York. Hey, How Brooklyn, New York, about? baby. What's going on? Uh, you know, I would have felt much better if we had got the win, you know. My problem – with the Canes from what I'm looking at is just the defense. <laughs> and it's the glaring topic right now. Everyone's talking about it. The defense is just terrible. And Baker is doing a terrible job. And our linebackers, they're not in position. They're slow. And I'm looking at McLeod had two tackles today. I'm, the, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, it, Carla. So the middle linebacker had two tackles on a team that ran for 540 yards. Terrible. Terrible. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Go for it. Don't say I didn't say so. Thinking, um, can you put another linebacker in? What about Brooks? What about Huff? I remember when Huff was coming out of college, everyone was saying he's good. He, he's an animal. He's a beast. But now, like, anytime you ask somebody, what about Huff? Oh, well, he doesn't know the, the playbook. The guy's a sophomore. How he doesn't know the playbook? Even uh, the other kid, Sam Brooks, it's like these guys are slow. They're slow to react. Although Brooks is fast, it's like he's slow to react. I don't know if it's a, it's it's coaching or is it just a talent issue? 
I don't know. And I and I kept hearing people talk about Charlie Strong. I would like to know if it's a possibility that Charlie Strong would even be interested in becoming the defensive coordinator. And would Manny Diaz actually allow that to happen? Because I'm not sure if Manny Diaz would look at it like, well, I'm not going to bring that guy in to take my job, you know? So Yeah. Got you, man. I don't know what's happening. Got you, man. Well, I appreciate you. I'm going a, I'm to a refer to some of these questions, and, uh, and and I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. Always, all day. Yeah, all right, so real quick, he ta- real quick, he talked about Charlie Strong. I'm going to pose that to you guys, but I'm going I'm to pose a question to him because we talked about uh, McLeod, two tackles. I, I don't think this guy's got over 15 tackles in the entire season, uh, solos, that is. Um, I, I don't know. But anyhow – he brought up a point. He was bringing up a point uh, talking about Charlie Strong. I don't think personally Charlie Strong would take this job. I don't think he'll take it. Again, it's back to it's back to it's back to money. You understand what I'm saying? So when it gets back to the dollars and cents, I have no idea. But real quick, uh, V12, talk to us, man, to, to what the caller said in regards to Charlie Strong. Do you think he'll take the job? It'd be hard pressed for Charlie Strong to take the job particularly due to the finance, the finances, Miami won't be able to pay. I don't believe he'll have to, he'll have to want to take that out of pure love for the hurricanes and him being a Florida guy. I don't see that because he would have to take a pay cut in order to be a defensive coordinator for Miami. Now, if it was the head coach job, that may be something different because I do believe Charlie Strong wants to be a head coach again, and yes. he, he 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 doesn't have to be a defensive coordinator. He can just wait it out until the perfect opportunity come for him to become a head coach. Mm-hmm. So as you see, I don't see him coming to Miami. Would I love to have him as the coordinator? Absolutely, but he's in he's in the driver's seat. He doesn't he's not hurting for the money. He's an experienced coach and he's a good coach. So I don't think he wants to. I don't think he he will accept the DC position, and if he does, he'll probably be at, at Alabama. Why come to Miami where you kind of have to rebuild a defense? Where at Alabama, you already have a defense that's pretty much solid every year. Solid and it's rolling, and you're producing linebackers in and out. Mm-hmm. They're not coming in and out like the running backs. Gotcha. Real quick, I'm gonna just pop this in here. Chuck Mobier again. Hold on. Every time Chuck Mobier donates, I chug Mobier. Coach Hayes, after going 10-0 to start 2017 season, we have gotten our butts kicked at the end of every year. Tired of the excuses. Uh, I've been a season ticket holder for 30 years. I will continue to support the Canes forever. But one thing I'm going to tell you, man, I appreciate you supporting my beloved Canes. You understand? Thank you so much for doing that, man. Um, And I'll normally play that thing real quick. Uh, G Black and $5 again. How many solo tackles does our starting uh, middle linebacker Jennings have on the season? 17 as a mic favoritism has to stop good point anybody want to refer to that real quick before i get to the caller well hey we we, we got to roll soon man yeah man like i told you here. if you got to go i get it i just let me know hey hit me with a thumbs up i got you man i'm rolling because i want my people to talk because this might this is the last one until we find out the bowl game so if y'all got to yeah. go man and ch- and chug more beer i get it you understand i totally get it man so I'm gonna say this: If you want this to be your last comment, yeah, it's up to you. All right, so make the last comment. I'm gonna say this, Kevin, before you leave. Thank you, man, for popping in, man. I, I appreciate it, man, taking the time out, coming on the channel, helping us uh, look better and get better, man. And so go ahead, uh, Balin. I let Ke- Kevin had the last word, and then we bring yeah, the call. So the on. other day, defense did absolutely horrendous. Our linebacker plays absolutely horrendous, and we got to figure it out. But going eight and two. I like where we're headed, and I'm I'm proud of the Canes. And I think uh, by Tuesday we'll we'll really see where we should have been ranked. Um, I still think we're a top 25 team. I just you know because at the end of the day we did lose to a, another top 25 opponent. It wasn't like we lost to an unranked opponent. Um, right. So I think we should be in that you know the the late teens, maybe you know 21 to 19 in that range, um, and that's where we should be going into a bowl gotcha. game. Um, but yeah, defense horrendous, linebacker horrendous. Uh, and our offensive line is atrocious. So, figure out which one of those threes they want to they want to really work on first. Which, if I was to lean somewhere, I would go uh, offensive line because we really need something to go there. And then, obviously, linebacker. And I put Carter in the box. That's my last opinion on that. 
I got you. Kevin, go ahead and finish it out, man. I know you guys got to run, man. Yeah, no problem. Well, first of all, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, no you know, I haven't talked Miami football. Uh, you know, I always watch out for them. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, it seems like there's not a lot of love for me back there in Miami. You know, so I haven't talked that football in a long time. But, um, you know, I'm always, always a Canes fan. You know, that's always part of my life. And I learned a lot from there. And, uh, you know, I always cherish that experience that I was there at. And, you know, I think for Miami as a football team right now, everybody needs to relax. Like like Aaron Rodgers says, everybody's got to relax. <laughs> you know, I, I think, to like I said in the beginning, and this is my biggest point, nobody preseason said Miami is a top five team. We have a chance to make the playoffs. So what is wrong with eight and two? Now, get, don't get me wrong. Today was embarrassing. I get it. I get it. We didn't tackle, and they rushed for 500 yards. Terrible. Terrible. I get it. But what's wrong with eight and two? Like if 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 during the season you guys would have would have said, oh, I think we'll go four and four, well then the eight and two season would be great. So it, it, it you know it nobody ever thought that we were gonna play Clemson in the first round of the playoffs, or we were gonna play Ohio State, or we so I think that just building on these type of games and really like I said, I wholeheartedly believe in how you respond to adversity. You know, I've had a lot of it in my life, and I pride myself on how I respond to it. And I think Miami can really show fans, you guys, Coach Hayes, V12, Valen, I think that they can show everybody, hey, okay, last last week they played good. Great. Hats off to them. But this week, you know, we came out and we really showed ourselves and how we can play. And now that game, you know, this game, you never know. This game right here might be a deciding factor in their next couple seasons. They might lose this game and they might go on the rest of this year and win and win and win, win a bowl game and start off 10-0 and again next year. You know, these those are the type of games that these blowout games are the type of ones that show teams and they really turn around into something great. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well said, man. Nice, uh, nice doing the show with you, Kevin. Hey, yeah, Coach, definitely, man. Coach Hayes, real, real, I, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I think I think Kevin just gave you your next your next topic, and we're gonna be off for a couple of weeks. What's wrong with eight and two? That may be the topic for a show upcoming show because I mean that may be something that you have to pose to the Canes Nation because you know it's gonna be a lot. We we don't like eight and two, but we got to figure out what's wrong with eight and two. So that's a good point. I don't Kevin. think I don't think we like eight and two in a blowout. That's what I think. Right. It is. But right. but Kevin, but, let me but, ask. you. Yeah, let me ask you this. We got a caller. He wants the caller wants to ask you a quick question before you go. Okay, caller, real quick, go ahead and ask him because they got to run. Say less, Kevin. Um, I know you you used to be a player and whatnot. Um, you're 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 one. You're an example of what's in the locker room. Um, especially with the noise from the outside. Let's say a situation with Mark D'Onofrio, where you know the defense isn't working where you know the defense is just isn't good and you know that the players are not being put in the right situation. As a mind of a player, do you, do you know where, like, damn, the coaches are putting me in a bad spot or you just go with the flow as a, as a soldier? In, in, in my mind, I hope you like pretty much like understand what I'm trying to say. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna let him off the line, and I'm gonna let you answer that, Kevin. Carla, thank you so much. Call right back in with your next question. Well, he going anyway. All right, go ahead, Kevin. Answer. I think that's an excellent question. Go oh, for it. Great question. And like he like he brought up an example of Coach D'Onofrio, which is also a close personal friend of mine, along with Al Golden. You know, those guys were recruited by brothers and all that kind of stuff. And I think that you know the defense isn't working and you know the defense is giving up a lot of points, but I'm from the school of you don't lose faith in your coaches. Um, you know, I never lost faith in Coach Coley and Coach Golden and Coach D'Onofrio and Coach Barrow and Coach P.J. Williams. I never lost faith in them because I committed to them. Um, you know, I think you do realize, though, like, I saw it now. God, the defense giving up a lot of points, man. I get it, right? But I don't think you lose that confidence in them when you when you commit to them. And I was right. committed to them, and I liked them. And you know, I, like 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 he said, you know, you see that, you know, damn, that's not right. Like something about that's not right. I'm on defense, you know. Like there's no reason for every time they run inside zone 
that they're dashing 35. Right. Or, or they run they run counter gap and 15 runs up the field and they kick them out and they run for 50. Like right. that can't be like I get that that's not right, but I, as a player, I think it's hard to lose faith in those guys that you see every day. Because you believe in them, just like you want them to believe in you. You know, I believed in Coach D'Onofrio as much as he believed in me. And people can say that might not be worth much. But to me, it was worth a lot. And, you know, I don't think anybody in that locker room right now is saying, man, Coach, whoever that DC is, Blake, whatever, and Coach, you know, Coach Diaz, they're not very good. I don't think anybody's saying that right now. I think – motto on the bus and on the plane ride home is or on the bus ride home because it was a home game is you know back to green tree is we just got to come out better for these coaches you know these guys put their lives on the line too and their livelihoods on the line and their families and their kids and we need to come out just as much as it might be on them and i buy that it might be on them schematically right but i think a little bit of it is on the players too so i think i think they need to give a little you know give and take on you know the blame and i don't think any team that the players don't believe in the coaches is close to an implosion and we were never that way when i was there never and i don't i don't see that happening now gotcha Uh, let me ask you just one quick i know you guys gotta go but i do want to say one observation i made and you a guy on the sideline i know that De'Ara king is not a um a vocal leader. Uh, he's not a uh, emotional leader. He's very stoic, very still faced. But I didn't see out of the eighty-five guys on the roster, I didn't see one guy, one guy, from the coach to the water boy to even my man Ed Reed, who was a very emotional player. Getting so I, I did see Manny bring up the guys, right? right. But I'm talking about player led emotions not one of those guys from Phillips sitting on the sideline just shaking his head to before it got out of hand I'm talking about when they when it popped off 21 straight right do you think that's important on a sideline in, in a game situation do you think that's highly important or do you think I, every team is different I think it's important but I think every team is a little bit different um I think there's some teams that really embrace that Johnny rah, rah, and I'm going to give a speech guy. And I also think there's a lot of teams that rely on, like you said, De'Ara King, where he goes to the sideline and he's super cool and comfortable. And no matter if it's 31-3, they're losing, or it's 31-3, they're winning. He's got the same demeanor. For me, as a quarterback coach and as a former quarterback, and for somebody that was very emotional when I played, I think for him – that is a great attribute to have um, as a quarterback. Now, if you're telling me the middle linebacker and the left tackle and the defensive tackle and the three technique and the safety want to get after some guys, great. But yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. Right. Like, I think that needs to be done. Those guys need to get after guys. But I think it's great when I see De'Ara King come off the sideline, whether he threw a pick or a touchdown or a run or whatever, he is stoic. And gotcha. I think I think that that goes a long way. That after he does, after the game's not going right, those guys look to him and they're like, "Oh, he's still in it. All right, let's go back in the huddle now. You know, he's still in this, and he's our guy. You know, he's right. going to fight until the until the clock say four zeros." And gotcha. I think that that is a big part. But I think it needs to come from some of the players more than the coaches. Like Manny Diaz can come up and bring the guys up all he wants, until some of those big leaders that are supposedly. NFL guys and 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 eight all ACC guys and this and that need to take up for that slack. Gotcha, man. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to ask because before you got out of here, guys, I'm not gonna hold you any longer. I'm gonna bring the next call on as soon as you guys check out Balin. I appreciate you, man. I'll be in contact with you. Uh, you didn't win. You didn't win the money this time. We're gonna do a tally up. Listen, also next week, if you want to jump on, guys. Wednesday after national or early signing day, I'm going to do a breakdown of all of our signees. So I want to do a breakdown that night. It's not going to be an hour show. It's going to be some time. So we may start a little early around 530 or so, whatever. But we'll talk about that later. I just want to put that out there. Kevin, thank you so much, man. Tell your brother, Kane, as always, man. Thanks a lot, man. And uh, we're going to continue this thing rolling, man. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Hayes. 
can you lose something you don't play in? So if Miami was to play Georgia Tech and they cancel the game, did Georgia Tech I'm not Tech bothering win? you, man. Bye, Miami man. Lose? I'm leaving. Exactly. So, no, I did not lose today. So, you want to hey, you you call this game this way, though? I know you would. Nah. Huh? No way. No wow. way. No way. But I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't in the game. All right, man. I appreciate you, Bailey. Thanks a lot, man, for having him on, man. All right, man. Cool. All right. All right, man. We got a call on. Call to talk to us. Give us your name, where you're calling from. Sorry about the delay, but I just wanted to get them out of here. No worries. No worries. Uh, it's Roland. Uh, I'm from Miami. So, I went to New Orleans. Uh, when you used to coach back then. Okay, man. What's going on with you, man? Hey, hey Vikes? You're supposed to say, yo. Come on, man. Come on, man. I hear you, baby. Yeah, yeah. Go for it, Roland. But, yeah, yeah. But first thing, so first thing I want to say is that uh, to all the fans and all that stuff is just that we improved, like, in all facets compared to last year. Like, we done lost to FIU. We done lost to Duke. We lost to Louisiana Tech, Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech. Like, we improved in all facets except the defense. So, like, I think that we should give Manny Diaz, like, four to five years. And, like, people got to understand, like, it took Dabo Sweeney, like, what, seven years to win a title? And, like, I know in Miami, you ain't got seven years to win a title, but I think that's the kind of patience maybe that we need for someone to build the program where it needs to be, to where it needs to go. And, uh... I just got one question for you, Coach Hayes, is that um, sure. how come we not running stunts on, like, the defensive line anymore? Like, last year, even last year, we was running stunts on the defensive line. We was, run, uh, we was lining up Gregory Russo everywhere. But we not, we not doing that type of stuff anymore. You, you know what's funny you say that, man, Roland, is that I said the same thing, man. We line up right in front of the guys, and we just think at, our talent is going to beat the guy in front of us because it worked against Duke. Again, Duke was not that good. Individually, they were not that good, right? It's not like they it was a bad game plan. I just think they don't have good players right now overall. And I mean, you look at night, you look at, at Phillips and you look at Roche last week, seven days ago, and you look at them this week, they look like two totally different people. Two totally different people, right? And you're correct. But the thing is, to answer to flip your question is everybody runs stunts against us and are super successful because the offensive line has a bad, especially our center, does a bad job with coming off because he buries his face mask in the armpit of the nose guard. He never sees that guy wrapping around. Never sees him. That's why Derek has so much pressure. But why they do, why they don't do that, I don't know. Maybe it's something they see in game film. Maybe they feel like Phillips and Roche can do it on their own. And Severa, I think I'm saying the name right, Severa can, can handle it. I, I don't know. I can't answer because I'm not in that, that coaching room, man. But I, I totally I, I totally agree with your observation. Yep. And just to say, it's just we need we just gonna need patience, man. Like to think that any coach, because there ain't too many coaches unless your name is Urban Meyer, that can take a six and seven team and be like, okay, let's go undefeated. We're gonna beat Clemson, we're gonna beat North Carolina, we're gonna beat all these teams, and we're gonna blow them all out every single game. Ain't no coach in the country that I can name off the top of my head that could do that. I just think as a fan base, we go crazy when we see that our team is underperforming or that they're like, you know, they're not reaching the 2001 Miami Hurricanes. Ain't nobody ever going to reach a 2001 Miami Hurricanes. Right. Period. But we yeah. might as well let – well, all we need to do is win. I mean, right now, take the loss. Granted, and I'm from Miami. I don't play football in Miami, all of that. Like, I'm I'm tracking. To lose a game, it hurts. It hurts the heart. Them boys, I know there was a couple of people crying in that locker room. But they're going to take it, and they're going to bring it back. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, the first thing I was saying, man, let's run it back. Like, right after the game, let's run it back. But hopefully we get, we'll get we we'll run it back next year, and I think right. we'll beat them. Yeah, we'll definitely get them, man. I, I believe in that, man. But I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your donation. I appreciate all of that, man. And I appreciate you even following me, man, even even remembering me. That means a lot to me, bro. So thank you, yep, man. No all, right, all right. Thanks man. a lot, man. I appreciate you. Yep. Bye now. V12, you got anything to say to what the caller had to say? Because I do want to make a point off of what he just said. I think that his point is observation is well taken. And I think to... I believe it was Balin's point or even Kevin. I believe that in my view, 
these adjustments over the season from a defensive standpoint has not been made. It could be very well that the coordinator doesn't have this much confidence in the defensive line and thinks that putting them in a straightaway position is the best position to put them in. Could be that they haven't grasped that part of the defense yet running stunts, which would probably be far more far-fetched. But sometimes if you don't have the talent to do certain things, then sometimes you just shy away from doing it. So the observation is great. I believe that hopefully next year as – if he's there or hope, hopefully once the defense improves next year, we'll get to see that those types of defense again being called throughout the game. Yeah, definitely, man. Real quick, let me holler at my little soldier right here. JK, what's up, coaches? What's up with you, man? Do your homework, buddy. I'm checking it. I'm checking it on Monday. All right. Uh, real quick. All right. So let me – I just want to make this one point right quick. And uh, I just saw it. Fragrance Play said something that was very big. Here we go. Uh, because because Roland that just called in did make a, a valid point. He says that that's true. Miami got to stop flip-flopping on head coaches. I think Manny has done a good – I mean, just let's be real, guys. If we lose this game by four points today, we're not having these same type of conversations. And, I, and I'm not making excuses, as me and the host one talked about that time on the show, about being mediocre, right? But I have been there too. I'll come in, I think, with a great game plan. Man, we got this. And, and a dude hang 50 on me. And I'm like this. What in the – coaching just as hard. Co and I know I'm a coach. I know I can coach. Now, that I know. And I don't try to say that to be conceited. I know I, I can – I know that. But it does happen like Kevin was saying. But, again, I think Miami and the upper brass need to – you got a hometown guy in Manny Diaz, right? Give him a chance. He may need to make some changes on the under ranks, on the coordinators and so forth. I get that. But let's see what some longevity does. Let's stop chasing the carrot on the treadmill thinking we're going to catch it. Let's give a little longevity. Hometown guy. I mean, he's really, he's woven into the Miami. Your daddy was the mayor of Miami. You understand what I'm saying? He's part of this culture, you know? Let's just see what he does. Long as he's still, if he's still popping off eight and two seasons, bro, like you said, V12, you asked me, would I take an eight and two and get blown out? I, I hate to say it, but I'll take an eight and two and get blown out, then taking two and eight and get blown out six times. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to make that point that that uh fragrance place uh said right there, man. Um, and that's what it is. Let me take this caller right quick. Caller, talk to us, give us your name, where you're calling from. Hey, this Kane City Cartel. What's up, man? I'm glad you called in. I saw you comment earlier. You said you had some insight on some sideline stuff. So talk to us, man. Man, listen, Coach. I don't know if it was just the, the, the nature of the beatdown, <laughs> but um, a couple guys checked out on Blake Baker tonight on defense, man. A few guys checked out on him. Mm -hmm. Uh. You know, he called, uh, he called a lot of guys around uh, to huddle around him. I think it was like the second to last defensive um, changeover. Mm -hmm. And uh, ain't nobody huddled around him. He just ignored him. He had, um, I saw a trend. It's like the whole second half, man, we getting shellacked. And um, as defense gets scored on and runs off the field, He's beating them halfway off the field, you know, clapping his hands and holding his hand out for, for, for high fives. And, you know, it, it, uh, that attaboy, it's okay, it's okay. And um, a couple guys gave him the, gave him the swerve. You know, you snatch your hand back and, and do the Dougie with it. Like, nah, so slapping your hand. I was like, whoa. That's terrible, so man. Just, I don't know if it's just – the nature of the of the beatdown or you know you know these guys you know they probably never lost in high school you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but but at the same time i saw a little bit of a a disconnect um blake baker he walked and followed jalal holly all the way from one end zone to the other end zone i said well he couldn't tear into him because he was one of the guys who didn't want to shake his hand and um Took his helmet off, walked all the way down. Blake Baker pacing right behind him. I'm like, oh man, he weaving through traffic. I'm like, man, he's gonna catch up and, and, and tear it, man. 
And he veered off and said, you know, he, he just stood on the sideline and pulled his arm. That's what Blake Baker did. And in my mind, I kind of think, you know, I I was looking for answers all game, Coach. Mm-hmm. Something told me, just look to the sideline. You might find some answers on the sideline. Mm-hmm. So I watched the sideline for a nice good while. Mm-hmm. And um, I noticed when you was talking about guys not having that spirited energy, rallying guys, it was none of that. Mm-hmm. It was none of that. Revan was checked out early. Like I'm talking about body. I'm not. I'm talking about not even standing by other teammates. Mm-hmm. Like guys just checked out. Like like they like zombies. Mm-hmm. But I want to ask you a question, though, Coach. I call I call for this question. That that's okay. regarding the insight that I had in the comments okay. when um, Kevin was talking about the energy and you know you guys seeing it, nothing working and the defensive guys kind of. You, you seeing what their energy like when they see nothing's working? That's what that comment was for. Mm-hmm. But um, my question is this: I don't remember how many weeks ago it was, but Blake Baker on the presser said, "Oh, we got some new wrinkles now. Jennings and McLeod. I'm gonna turn them loose. Remember that? Yeah. I simplified the scheme. I got the scheme. We got it where." We gonna just tell them to turn it loose, turn turn them loose, and let them go. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I'm like, it's either the scheme, or it's either they just not there as mm-hmm. players. I see Avery Huff come in in the um, Avery Huff come in in the fourth quarter and get more tackles than Zach McLeod had in the whole game. Yeah, Avery Huff had not sniffed the field all season, coach. I, I get it, and, and that's the ask, issue. I, and if he don't know the playbook, then he just out athleted Zach McLeod. I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're right, and you're right. And, and I'm gonna just say this to you. Cause, well, I want you to ask your question, and I'll answer that piece. This is my question right here. Um, mm-hmm. Is there a at the collegiate level? It, it sounds a lot of times when I talk, um, when I when I when I think about Blake Baker, I look at him as more like a player's coach and a fan as much as a coach, not the authoritarian dictator as mm-hmm. what, what you would think of a coordinator. You know, um, he's a little more um, of a fan, so that might lack some type of respect from other guys, but um, it seems like a little bit of a favoritism when it comes to certain players and he gets asked about those specific players and he knows the production. He sees the film, but those mm-hmm. guys are still playing. Mm-hmm. He's the only senior other than Amari Carter on the defense. Mm-hmm. That's that's hurricane. You know what I'm saying? So he's seen them for at least two years because he's been here two years. Right. Roche Phillips, that's different. I'm talking about Amari Carter and, and, and Zach McLeod. He's seen those guys. They came up through the ranks, what? right. He knows what he's at, what he has, and he says the same feel every time. Yeah, they're just getting better, and this and that, this and that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't get it. I don't get it if he's just so, trying to keep the senior guys, the the upperclassmen, keep them in there and save like hoard these young guys to say this is the only season they gave us a mulligan. That's true. The, the league gave us a mulligan. Anybody can come back. Yeah. You will not lose a rent. You will not lose a year of eligibility. Let them play. Get the young guys in. So yeah. what? I, my question is this. I'm gonna I'm 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 round it up. Okay. My question is this: um, Do you see that that is a liability as a coach when um, you consistently put in guys that are not producing? You got a lot of young guys down there, and then you start, um, and you're not getting the result. Can that be a liability just as much as your team, just as much as the linebacker coach tackling? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Much, very much so. And I'm gonna answer your question. I'm gonna let you all kind of man, this thing jumping over here. But yes, you're right. hundred percent you're hundred percent correct. And I'm gonna let V12 jump in on this too. But man, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for calling me. You know that man, you home team, man. We all in there. All right, coach. Thanks, man. I'm gonna definitely I'm gonna answer two parts of that question you asked me. All right. Okay now. All right, real quick for real quick for I answer that question, uh, 
Do me a favor, everybody, if you're on there now, hit the subscribe button, hit that like button. Man, let's get this thing jumping. Hit the likes. Let's get them rolling. Let's get the algorithm jumping, man. I'm on here. V12, you know if you got to go home till you got to go, I'm riding out tonight. You know what I'm saying? Hey, it's like the Titanic. It's going down. I'm going down with it. You understand? But I'm going to answer, answer uh, uh, Cartel's question. He talked about Blake Baker being a player's coach. In my personal opinion, that's not a bad thing. But here's what the negative is about it. That's good when things go good, right? But when things go bad, this type of things happen with those type of coaches. And you can look at that across the board. You know, you hear the NFL coaches, oh, he's a player's coach. He's a this coach. Well, this da da da. Like Bill Belichick is not a player's coach, right? But then when you look at a Mike Tomlin, the issues he was having with AB and all that stuff, that's the player's coach. That's what he looks at him as a player's coach. So when it goes bad, it just goes out of control. You don't ever hear about discipline issues at New England because he nips it in the bud. But in, in, in Pittsburgh, you hear the ship get a little rocky, da 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 because that's the characteristics of a player's coach. That's what happens. Uh, second part of that, um, or, or let me ask you this, V12, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think with Blake Baker – and I think the question was the talent level he's playing. Is it a liability not having putting in the young guys and some, and I think he talked about favoritism in a sense as well. Mm -hmm. Players see, players see what's going on. Players know what's going on. And right. they know if they're better than the man in front of them. And it can, can become a liability if, you're putting the same person in play after play after play and they're not producing. And then you're not allowing the younger guys to grow as well. The second thing cartel I want to address with cartel's point was when you have a coach like Blaker, um, Baker, Blake Baker, and he isn't able to produce on the defense, you have the type of attitude on the sideline, because remember, I'm not sure what Blake's coaching tree is, but he wasn't a sought after defensive coordinator. He wasn't a big name defensive coordinator. And so players tend to respect those type of big names. So when to, to coach the point, when it's going good as a player's coach, it's going good. But when it's going bad, it's almost like, man, who are you? Like you ain't, you know, you Manny Diaz's boy. Like you haven't really had any real type type of head, you know, defensive coaching job, defensive coordinator job before you got this job. And so mm -hmm. it kind of goes south very, very quickly. Very quick. And and so now to answer his question, part two of what you were talking about was the favoritism piece. Here's what my philosophy always was, and I'm not the coach at Miami. I get it. I always looked at it like this. If I have a senior and I had 12 games with him and I have a freshman, let's just say even a sophomore, and he's got three years left, so that's 36 games. If I have to take a choice between a dude that's giving me the same production or less with 12 games, I'm going to take the young puppy who's got 36 games because he can get better. See, if they're on the same level, if they're even or he's playing below, I'm going with the puppy because I have more time with him to make him even better. He is already capped out in my eyes. The senior has capped out in my eyes, right? Now, here's the tough part about that. That's different than high school. That's different when you're not seeing. This is a national stage. So now the question becomes, uh, Cartel, what happens when the young dude starts taking a dump on the field because he's going to go through those early time woes? Then he'll go to fans. He'll go to boosters. He'll go to this person. Why is senior not playing? Blah, 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 blah. I ain't going to lie to you, man. To be a coach in college, it is very difficult. And the reason it's difficult, I always say this, because our boardroom is on national television every Saturday. Football is no different than a corporation. Corporations do the same thing. The difference is you don't see what Microsoft does in the boardroom. You just see, or Apple. You know what you see? The iPhone. That's all you see. 
You see the product. You don't see the process. In football, you see the process right before your eyes. And that, and the product is the final score, the final record, bowl games, natties, whatever. And that's the problem, and that's the hardest part when you're dealing with fans. You understand what I'm saying? So I just said all that to say that, man. Guys, you're more than welcome to call on in. Let's get this thing rolling. I'm not getting off. We at 82 likes right now. I'm not getting off until we get 18 more V12, at least. That's 18 more people need to jump in. We got 120 on the, on the in the chat right now. Let's get it, man. Let's get it. So with all that being said, I'm going to just say this last piece um, while we get this thing going here. Exactly. Kane City Cartel, he just said, and the puppy ceiling is higher. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But he made up a good point. Let me ask you this. Let's talk about coming back. And he, he made a very valid point about a mulligan, right? And people who play golf know a mulligan is like a you play it, you get a do-over. So regardless of what happened, everybody gets a free do-over. Do all of the my I mean, do they make a pact to say we all come back? Because I'm gonna be honest with you. The only person I feel that may have really solidified a very good draft spot is Brevin Jordan, Jalen Phillips. I'm talking about maybe round one, two, or possibly, let me see, three, two, or possibly a late one. Let me go backwards. Imagine what this team looks like if everybody comes back. Everybody, from De'Ari King to everybody. Uh, Borgales, good good call, Garcia. He may, he may be the only one, but again, it's the kicker. They don't get them first-round draft picks. They gone, but yeah, you know. So, so what do you think, V12? It's going to be hard for all of them to come back. The NFL money or where they think they may be protected, protected to go is going to loom large in a lot of those young guys' minds. And to be honest with you, I don't think they all need to come back. A couple of them need to declare. They need to go. I think their time has been ran at the University of Miami, and it's just time to go. I think McLeod's time is up. I think the only way he comes back is if he goes into it and he finds out that, you know, he's very great or very low, which I, I think may be the case because this year I don't think he's really shown much. I think Bubba Bolden will leave. I don't foresee him coming back. I think Jace, uh, I think Phyllis, Jalen Phillips will leave because I don't think he want to risk probably getting hurt again. So, uh, Brevin, I think if he grades pretty high, he's gone. Mike Harley, I think, stays. It's a couple of people at Boulder Goddess, I think, goes. So pretty much we're going to have, I would see, five to maybe seven U1 players leave. The rest, we bring in the younger guys. We hopefully recruit heavily and bring in guys who can fill an immediate void in linebacker, whether they're a sophomore or whether they come in as a true freshman, they, they can play and they're talented. We need to give those these, those guys a shot because we don't have we don't have anyone else Besides Jennings and Sam Brooks, I, I can see right now that can play the position. I, I, I got you. And I'm looking at the comment section. It's booming when I pose that question, right? Like David right here. David uh, Chauffeur, I guess that's how you say it. I, I apologize if I pronounced it wrong. Mark Harley is gone. And I'm going to tell you something, man. Maybe I, maybe I look at stuff wrong. When I think of NFL draft, if I'm a player and I know I have great talent, and especially what Cartel just said, I got a free do-over. I don't think Mark Harley has done, uh, compared to the receipt. See, this is what people don't realize. I don't look at just Miami. I'm saying, who am I compared to who is coming out in this draft in this class? See, that's what you have to ask yourself. Who am I compared to who's coming out in this in this draft class? And I just don't think Mike Harley has done enough to warrant a high draft pick. People don't understand. Sixth, fifth, and fourth rounders do get cut. And they don't make a bunch of money, guys. After that first round, that money goes boo. Yeah, Harley, I agree with you. Harley is one of those receivers who I believe needs to return for another season. He has not done enough. He still has some work to do with his hands. 
and I can name at least one or two hurricane receivers because guess what, Coach? Everyone thinks they're NFL ready. And then you have these agents who are going to say, some agents don't tell you the truth. So Mike Holly said, what, what am I going to grade out? So they're going to probably tell Holly he grades out maybe two to, two to four, two to five. But traditionally, UM, as of late, in the last five, four or five years, UM receivers who leave early, they do not do well in the NFL draft. Tommy Streeter, and I can name a couple of other few NFL receivers who really don't do well. Mm-hmm. And – for example, Philip Dorsett has done way more, way better than Mike Harley, comparatively speaking. He could put drafted in, I think, the second or third round. I don't think Mike Harley even gets that grade as it stands right now. If he comes back another year, he may get a second or third grade round. So I think Harley needs to stay, but if he leaves, good luck to him. Right. And then also looking at a couple of people, because we definitely get into the main one of this. Uh, Brevin Jordan, I think, will get a high draft grade. Uh, look at this one. Fragrance Place. Roche is projected to be a first high rounder. What's your thoughts on that, V12? I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Love you to death, Fragrance, but I don't, I don't I disagree with that one. But go for it. I think based off this season, I mean, his, his body of work may garner a late first round, but – the way the way how UM's UM's D line has been trending over the past years, I don't foresee him foresee him being a first rounder, more like second or third rounder for Roche in my book. Exactly. Uh, also, let me see here. Um. All right, let me see here, Brevin Jordan. We talked about his being injury prone. Let's go. Uh. I'm trying to look at this thing here, man. I just saw it. All right, let's jump into this. Let's just jump straight into this. De'Aaron King. So here's the question. Does he come back? Does he not? As a fan, you want him to come back. That That is my hope. I think he could benefit from coming back. Depending on how the season wraps up, he may do some soul searching and decide to come back. And again, it it really depends upon how they're graded and what their agent, whoever, I guess the school who does the grade outs, gets the uh, critiques from the NFL to kind of figure out where they would possibly land in the draft until he kind of has a better idea on where he'll possibly land. I think he'll hold off. But more than likely, if he if he can play quarterback and be drafted as a quarterback, he will probably leave University of Miami. Uh, I'm gonna just tell you this, man. I'm gonna tell you what hurt him tonight, and it wasn't his fault by any means. But the quarterbacks are judged differently, in my opinion. Um, this game hurt him uh, from a quarterback standpoint, right? You're supposed to be the leader of the program, and I'm not saying this is fair by no means. I'm just talking about how things are perceived. And unfortunately, the people who make these decisions are not coaches. They are fans. Prime example, Jerry Jones is a fan, but he wants to be the GM, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Even a lot of these GMs were just – they were scouts, but not necessarily coaches. They weren't in the room with these guys. So – um, and the quarterback is always going to be the marquee player. He's the one that is going to be the head coach, the quarterback. And in the NFL, it's the quarterback, then the head coach. Uh, so I think he only makes a better uh, uh, campaign for himself if he comes back next year. I really do. Uh, because I think the young man really wants to play quarterback. See, a lot of people are, are, are about, oh, well, coach, you know, he can go and play receiver. I don't know if he wants to play receiver. Why not? I mean, I think I think of in my heart of hearts he wants to play quarterback because if he wanted to play receiver, why not stay at receiver where you initially were? See, it's different than when you were a quarterback always, and then when we say you were recruited to Houston even as a receiver. So that's my thing. If you were, if you if you have in your heart to play receiver, then why not stay at receiver? That's just how I look at it. So I personally think. That King comes back. Uh, I just want to say one thing quickly about money. The 2018 draft, Baker Mayfield, Baker Mayfield gets drafted 
in the 2018 draft, Baker Mayfield gets drafted for 32 million first round draft pick. 32 picks later, Lamar Jackson gets drafted for nine million. That shows you how drastic the money drops off. And that's in the very the very first pick of that draft was 32 million. The last pick of that draft, nine million dollars. That's a lot of money that drops off. So how much money do you think is left by the time you get to the end of the second round? When I'm talking about generational wealth, where you're going to take care of your family for life. 32 million, you can flip that 10 ways from Sunday, right? I get it. LaMarcus got 9 million. So what do you think happens at the 64th pick of the draft, which is the last pick of, of the second round? How much money do you think is out there now? So that's what I'm saying. Don't. Don't make an emotional decision. Make an educated decision. And that's all I'm saying. We got a call in. We're pretty much going to wrap this thing up, man. I know we've been pushing it hard. i just been pushing it because I love my Canes. I don't want to see them go. I'm going to take this last call and I'm going to cut the things off. Caller, talk to us. Give us your name. Where you're calling from? Yeah, man. It's me again, man. It's Mike, Mike Lowry. What's up, man? I had, to, I had to call back in, man. Man, yeah, you know, if he leaves, that'll be a bad decision. Cause you know the money gonna drop off right now. How many quarterbacks they got right now? They got about seven or eight of them. They got the six of them for sure. So he need to stay. He he right. he helping the you become the right. you. You know with his decision making. You know it, it, you know what 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 he did for Houston. What he doing for Miami right now? You know. Like, yeah, and, and, and team, you make my point. You know I saying? said this in the pregame show. You know, if he leaves now, the money drops off. I know his mom was sick. Somebody was saying the mama need money, but trust me, them little peanuts ain't nothing. By the time you go through the agent, because the agent's gonna bang your head to get you ready for it for the draft. You don't yeah, even need you know an agent. Do. You don't even need I'm just saying agent. that's how it go. Yeah, Lamar. Lamar. Right. Lamar. You may need to get on the phone with Lamar. But I'm just saying, you're right. But there are still a lot of expenses that go into that. The training facility you need to get ready for the league. All of that kind of stuff, man, going to eat into that pocket. And so, yeah, I mean, I mean, you made my point that I was yeah. making earlier. Yeah, and another thing, I believe in Red, Red Lashley, man. I, when I watched F SMU, I used to love F SMU when I was a young kid. That was another story program that done fell off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and for him to bring that offense over to us, I expect next year for us to really be that high tempo, fast paced offense. I, I I believe that with 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 the with the videos that's being put out, with all the Miami content of YouTubers, all the different um people that's dissecting, they need to watch our film. They need to listen to us. We know what we're talking about. We ex players, ex coaches, coaches still. We 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 influencers. We know what we talking about. We dissect the game. We dissect the life. You ain't coming to the right right now. Those these games are like practice. They don't got mm -hmm. no fans in the stadium, eighty thousand, hundred thousand fans. They're gonna distract them. So when you out there to play football in an environment where you slowing the game down like that, you supposed to be at your high level of potential. The game is ninety percent mental, ten percent physical. Mm -hmm. So when, when you you talking about the fan base, the fan base, oh, we we got high expectations. Yeah, we got high expectations because we don't see, we know what Florida football like. Mm -hmm. And so we we know we're not representing Florida football. So when we got fans that's upset, we calling for people here. We serious. We yeah. want you to get it together. What happened yeah. to the defense? You seen what the Irish did to them? The Irish blitzed every time they they kept a man up there. They three or four, nine, six, seven, eight men up there, man. Mm -hmm. They stopped Howell. They they stopped him from being great. We mm -hmm. want we you go over top the Ivy. We got all this stuff going on with our blades. We can't even get nothing serious back there. The 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 back of the line got to be the best of ever. Mm -hmm. They can't let nothing get back there. Yeah, we we got some hurdles to jump, man, Mike. But we we really do. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, like I say. This is why I love this game. There's so many variables to it, man. Um, it's so, you know, it's probably one of the most, com it is the most complex sport out here. There's so many moving parts. I mean, this is like a, I don't know. I don't know about cars. I'm just talking a Bugatti engine. This ain't no Toyota Corolla. 
It, right. Foot, game, game of football got all type of turbo engine boosters. It's so many moving parts to make this thing work when you're talking about a program that it's just hard to just pinpoint one thing when you talk about this game, man. But listen, Mike, I appreciate you, man. I'm not sure how long you've been following me, man, but I appreciate you. Thank you for watching, man, hanging out with me tonight for two hours and 15 minutes, man. Better believe it. Oh, Dad, I appreciate you, man. Thanks a lot. All right, man. All right. Lakers all day, man. You can call in, but you got to do it right now, man. Can we get ready to get out of here? I know you say you want to call in. Long time supporter, V12. I'm going to let you finish up, wrap up, whatever you want to wrap up now before Lakers all day. Call in right now. I've been waiting for this dude to call in forever, and he is part of the reason, too. One of the reasons, KC, I think, Kane hooked us up with, with uh, the wholesome one and so forth, and he was part of it. So, yeah, boy, to welcome to call in, but you got to do it right now. V12, go for it. Uh, We're going to wrap this thing up, man. Thanks, Coach. As we wrap up, one thing we try to do, I, I, I know I try to do is not overreact to what's happened. It's, it was an emotional type of game. And most people, by what we they spoke about today, the callers and people who left comments seem to be very happy with the progress University of Miami has made. I am one of those people. I'm happy with the progress. I do, someone spoke about coaching. Continuity of coaching is a definite thing we need to look into of head coaching. Now we know throughout the coaching carousel, the head coach remains and then they make, may make adjustments to the defensive coordinator, OC, and other small, uh, other coaches, O-line, yeah, whether, whether it be O-line or receiver coach, et cetera, et cetera. We, from a coaching standpoint, we just don't know how long Manny Diaz has. Now, personally, I would like to see him get the same amount of time. And if he's doing well, extend his time. Like, you know, as Al Golden or Randy Shannon. So I do believe in continuity with the Canes. I'm looking forward to Manny Diaz being there, hopefully, for the long run. Hopefully, we could build a dynasty. Someone mentioned Dabo Swinney. I agree, Dabo Swinney didn't start. At the, at the top, he started at the bottom with Clemson, and they're a powerhouse now. But Dabo Sweeney had a little different swag coming into the league, I must say. He was pretty much like a, 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 a gambler, straight shooter. He rolled a lot of dice. So hopefully Manny Diaz, as he, as he matures in coaching, can can you know, can know make sure he bring bring all the cavalry together and make either head coaches or coaches, D-line coaches, right. and all the coaches bring them in. And players and move this, prepare this University of Miami forward. And I think we can do it. I just, it was just something about tonight's loss that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, including myself. And I think mm -hmm. the way how we lost. And we can have eight and two all day, but we have to be able to, to compete with teams that have talent on our level. We have to be able to, com to compete with teams like that. Definitely, man. I'm going to give my last words as soon as I get this call in. I think it's my man's right here. Let me check it out. Real quick, man, caller, give us your name, where you're calling from. Hey, man, how you doing? This is Ira. I'm calling from uh, Pembroke Pines, uh, Florida here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What's your name again? I Ira. Ira. Okay, go ahead, Ira. Hey, listen, man, I was watching the game, and first of all, let me just say this. I've been a, a UM fan since UM fan since the 1980s. Okay. I was so dis I was so disappointed in what I saw today that University of Miami and that that North Carolina game. I was so disappointed. And you know what? Earlier, me and my son were sitting down. We were watching your show, listening to your show. I believe you had you had Kevin Olsom on there uh, talking, and this other uh, young guy talking on there. Yes. And they were saying. It, it wasn't the coaching staff. My thing is, come on, man. You, you, it is the coaching staff. That was an, a, a totally embarrassing, embarrassing game for every Hurricane fan in South Florida. And my thing is, the, the lack of lack of coaching, lack of motivating, lack of no kind of discipline. The basic stuff in that game, as far as tackling and, and tackling. It's number one, and it, it's Manny Diaz was uh, the coach on the coaching staff over there in Texas 
with uh, this head coach, uh, Mac uh, Brown, Bra- Mike Mac Brown, Brown. Mac Mike Brown, Mike Mac Brown. Thank you, Mac mm-hmm. Brown fired him. Mike yes. Brown fired him, and Manny Diaz got that job because of his father, I believe, was the mayor of Miami. So it was a favorite. It was a uh, he has experience, but it was a little bit of favoritism because of the the uh, the roots. Of uh, Manny's father was the, the mayor here, but Manny got that job, and it's clearly Manny should have been fired last season. But th- this is this season. Manny shows that he is not a head coach. The, in my point of view, I've been I've been around a long time, my man. And let me mm-hmm. tell you something. I'm 57 years old. I'm a student of the game, and I'm and I'll go way back. Uh, Michael Irvin, Coach S. Kennedy, uh, 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 all these uh, 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 all these players who played at the U- University of Miami. And the whole, if, if I had my way Monday morning, I would fire Manny and the whole coaching staff, and Ed Reed would be offered that job as the head coach because this is this program is going down and it's embarrassing. And you know, I, I, I love all the Florida teams, but this is uncalled for. And if you don't fire the, the, the whole coaching staff and you bring these guys back next season, it's going to be a repeat. And these young players are at the University of Miami. They're hungry. They want to learn the game. They want to play the game, but they have to be coached right. And our mm-hmm. talents of Miami, our, our talents out there, Miami Northwestern, Carroll City, all the South Florida teams, when are we going to recruit these young players that's coming out of a high school especially Miami Northwestern, the Golden the, the Bulls. I mean, I've seen tonight, I've seen better, better play by high school teams in South Florida than this garbage that was on the field tonight. I am so disappointed. I am, I am a native of South Carolina, born and raised in South Carolina, but I live here 30 some years, 40 years in South Florida, and I'm rooting for the Hurricanes. Mm-hmm so disappointed and i gotta tell you something my son loved your show you oh, thank he you, introduced you welcome he 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 loves you to death he watches your show he puts it up on youtube for me to watch also <laughs> and i got i got i got one of you because of him because my son he really loves your show and let me tell you my man you put on a good show and you make sense and i love the talent and i and i thank you so much for bringing me on air but uh Going back to the Miami Hurricanes, we have to change this. And let me tell you something. If, if I got to go out there, and matter of fact, what I did, the athletic uh, director, Blake James, mm-hmm. I Googled him. He's the athletic director. I'm going to send him. He has his phone number on on the website and his email address on the website. And I'm going to send him an email. Uh, matter of fact, uh, coming Monday morning, I'm going to send out an email, e- email and just let him know I was really disappointed. Hey. I'm thinking about coaching because I am so disappointed in this team. And man, we can put a better product. This is not the hurricanes of the, the 90s right. and the 2000s. We're better right. than this, man. We're better okay. than this, garbage. And then, you know, I'm going to go ahead and end this in, 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 in a second. But let mm-hmm. me tell you something. Manny Diaz is not the guy who is leading the program there. He's not our guy. And matter of fact, we're only showing Manny Diaz on the sideline. Where are these other coaches, position coaches? They're not stepping up. When these guys, I'm, I'm just going to say this right quick. When okay. I watch Alabama game tonight, Nick Saban, when you make a mistake in the game, Nick Saban, he's blowing up, he's throwing clipboards, he's throwing his hands up in the, in the air. And when you come off that field, you're going to answer to him why you missed that tackle, why right. you didn't do that play. And discipline, and this is why Alabama – uh, Alabama uh, is more better, and he's they're they're well coached, they're well taught, taught mm-hmm. uh, uh, coach, and there's 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 and football and sports, you coach them, but there's gotcha. no room for error. Gotcha. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. No so problem. Much I want to know before you go. I'm gonna ask you a quick question before you go. Go ahead. And I need seven more likes before I can get off of here. So hit the like button. Okay, Here's I my will. I will. no no Definitely. not. I was, I was talking to the caller to the viewers. But here's my question for you. You said Ed, you said you fired Manny tonight to make Ed Reed the head coach. Yes. Yes. 
Why? I would say, it, I, would, I, would, I want a quick. I want a real quick answer, like a very quick though, not like long. Just why? Why? Like if you had to sell this, I don't know what you do for a living, but if you had to sell Ed Reed to somebody in two sentences, why? Ed Reed is one of the best who ever, along with Sean Taylor, who ever played with the University of Miami. He understands the discipline of not making mistakes. He's an all pro. He's he's a Hall of Famer. He'd been there. He'd been there. He played at University of Miami. And I can see on his face when they do show the camera on his face that he's disappointed. Ed mm -hmm. Reed will bring in talent. He will coach. He will coach the players. He will coach the coaches. He's, he's a guy who's been proven. He went to a championship. He went to uh, a Super Bowl. Okay. He, All right, in, fine. In NFL, That's great. But, but That's he, great. Hold on, hold on. I, cause I just want a short answer. But here's not my reason. Okay. Everything you okay. said pertains to him playing. Not to him coaching. Exactly. So my question to you is right, and this is why I want our fans to be careful about. This is what our fans to be careful about. Be careful what you ask for, right? The only yeah. reason, and I'm gonna make a comparison. The only reason Dion didn't get to you at the Florida State job, he didn't have enough mm -hmm. in his res. He didn't have enough in his resume. That's my only reason. Okay. okay. Air Reed is Air Reed is in the same boat. That's just like Ray Lewis. Mm -hmm. Because you're a great motivational speaker doesn't make you a great head coach. Doesn't make you a great coach. Just because you're a great player. Hold on, hear me out. Because you were a great player. I'm not saying he's not. I'm going to make that clear. I'm mm -hmm. not saying Ed Reed is not. Will not be a great head coach. I just want to justify picking him tonight and at 12 midnight making Ed Reed the head coach in the morning. That's all I'm saying. And here's what I'm trying to say. Ed Reed comes in there. He motivating like a mug. But you got to be able to – one thing and, – and I'm not saying Manny does this or not. I'm just making blanket statements about be, in the coaching realm. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. It's almost like a – I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you're in the business field. I, I'm not either, but I'm just making an example. Just because mm -hmm. I'm the top salesman of my business doesn't mean I can be the CEO of that business. That's true. Just because I make the most sales, I'm on the top of the board. I, park, I got my, 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 my own parking space at the company. Does not mean I can mm -hmm. run because it takes a total different skill set. And that's exactly. all I'm saying. So we have to be careful asking for Ed Reed when Ed Reed hasn't climbed the ladder and you're gonna put him on the stage this high because we don't know what he we don't know what his temperament is. We know what his temperament is on the field, but what is his temperament mm -hmm. when it comes to a coach not being able to do it? He ready to fire everybody, blah, blah, blah. Like we don't know that. And so that's what I want to be careful. That's what you we can't jumpstart guys because of what they did. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying. I, I, I just I just want to say that because I don't want to go long, but I just want to be careful because a lot of Kane fans are saying that oh we need to get mm -hmm. Ed Reed and, and Ray Lewis could be the defensive coordinator and and, and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, come on guys I appreciate your honesty I, sure. I appreciate your honesty and then that's that's a fair question and that's not biased and I really appreciate you saying that and my thing is. You're absolutely right. He's a great motivator. He did things on the, on the field when he was at UM. He did things in the NFL. Mm -hmm. My thing is, I, my thing is that Manny Diaz is not the guy. And, and, and let me tell you something. Sure, Manny Diaz is probably trying to motivate these young guys. But I think that in my, my years of, uh, uh, I only played at a high school level, but my years of playing of watching football up until today, like I said, I'm 57 years old. I think that Ed Reed can come in, build his staff, build a team, uh, get pieces as far as coaching fan wise, put it in place, and I think that he can do a better job because it's clearly the Manny Diaz and the rest of the coaches, they're not coaching these guys. And you see, and the commentators say the same thing come on, you're not tackling, you're right, you, you, the motivation is not there. So mm -hmm. We have, we have to make a change. We right. have to make a change somewhere. If we don't fire so, uh, Manny Diaz, we have to at least get a better defensive coordinator there on that team because, listen, we have to make a change because this is embarrassing for mm -hmm. me and the Hurricane fans right. and the whole South Florida. So right. we have to do something. We can't let this go by and say, okay, all right, we're not going to fire anybody. We're not going to uh, do anything. We may make a bowl, uh, bowl game, and then we'll start off the season next year because it'll be the same trickling effect next year. 
I'm with you. I'm going to say this last piece, and I'm going to go from there. Thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate you. We got to get off. We at 2.30, Mark. I got to get off. Uh, V12 got to get off. This is it. But I'm going to say this last piece, and I'm going to be out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want to just say I love you, man. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I love you. You're doing a great job, and I will always continue to listen to you. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you so much, man. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye now. Yes, sir. Well, I'm gonna hit him with the. I'm gonna hit him with this right here, man. Did it come through? No. Oh. <laughs> hey, I love it, man. And I know something. And I know sometimes callers can call and get long-winded, and I love it. But here's the thing. I'm going to say this last piece. I'm going to say my closing, and we out of here. Football is no different than a business. If that formula works, more people would be doing it. Every school would go get their best player and make them the head coach. Florida State would have got Dion. Miami would go get uh, 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 Ed Reed, per se. You know, if they want to be around coaching, I'm saying. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I would probably take Ken Dorsey before I took Ed Reed just because he's been in the game of a coaching game, I'm saying. Um, let's see here. Georgia would go get Herschel Walker. Uh, and again, I'm not, I know those guys may not want to coach, but what I'm saying is if, if that's the case, if that formula works, V12, more people would be doing it. Would you agree or disagree? Yes, and in part that formula, it does work sometimes, but it doesn't doesn't go from best player to the to the highest coaching rank position. That normally has the stepping stone, maybe from like like Ed is doing. Maybe he's a assistant to Manny Diaz to get around the kids to get exposed to the uh, not kids to, to the to the to the young young fellas yeah. exposed mm -hmm. to the young fellas, and then who knows maybe elevate them to. How about defensive coordinator to start off with? Or DB coach to start off with? How about a DB coach? I could take that. Get more acclimated. But I would even say with his with his talent, he could probably be a coordinator. And I do understand what the caller was saying, the brother from South Carolina, because sometimes you think these big names attract other big name coaches as well as players who want to be associated with these type of these type of coaches. So, for example, you have Ed Reed as your head coach. That could definitely help you in the recruiting aspect of things. But if you have Ed Reed on your staff in general as the defensive coordinator, who wouldn't want to play for a Hall of Famer All Pro coach like Ed Reed? So, I'm kind of torn. I don't think it should always have to be coaching ranks. This go up the ranks. Sometimes. He can't do can't do any worse than a five and seven season. So why not if 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 the chance presented himself, just throw him in there and he learned by learn by you know by experience. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm sorry for laughing. Bert, hey, you need come and be funny. Could you imagine Michael Irvin as head coach? We'd be on death penalty within five years. That's a Listen, good and, and, and that's and that's what I'm trying and that's, and that's what I'm trying to and here's the thing. Who says Ed Reed is a motivator outside of coaching? I'm being honest with you. I can hear Michael Irvin motivating the team before I hear Ed Reed was speaking out of emotion. And I'm not I'm not saying Ed Reed is not. Don't get me wrong, guy. I just think that if that formula was better, if that formula proved to be uh uh, uh to prove to work, baby, this is a business, this is about money. People would do it. I don't care if you want to coach. I would give you 15 million, Herschel Walker, to be the head coach. You ain't making 15 million dollars a year in whatever business venture you're doing, selling hot dogs with your name on it, whatever. If I get you 15 million dollars to be the head coach, because 15 million dollars is peanuts if I'm gonna make 100 million dollars a year and win a natty. The formula, I don't think the formula works. I, I don't know a guy right now who is a head coach that was one of the top players on their program. And I'm gonna tell you why that pro why I don't think that works. Hey, can you name one? Uh, uh V12. I'm just out the cuff. One, one of the top players that was in the NFL or in college that became the head coach and it, and is killing it. Well, Scott Not Frost, a player. 
Scott, Scott Frost was a, a good college football player in Nebraska. And when he was at UCF, not doing very well now back in Nebraska. But your Josh point is Heifel. well taken. Josh no, no, Heifel, well, your point is well taken. No, you he, in between. No, you know what I'm saying? He went up the ranks. He didn't come out playing, and now I'm the head coach. That's true, he too. Learned, he learned the coaching ranks, and then he became – I'm talking about, dude, take his helmet off today, put on the coaching headset tomorrow, let's go. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't – because guess what? If that worked, I'm not talking about a guy who went up the rank like Brian Hartline. I think is going to be an excellent head coach someday at Ohio State. He went through the Dolphins, played at Ohio State, went there, went back to his alma mater, blah, blah, blah. When he gets his opportunity, but he's going through the ranks. You can't just jump. You can't build a house from the, from the, from the roof down. You got to build a foundation. And here's why I say that formula doesn't work. Nine times out of 10, the top players in any sport, are the worst coaches. And the reason that is, and we out of here on this note, because their athletic ability was so great, so great, that when they were wrong, they were still right. And it's hard for them to teach a young man who may not have his or her ability what they did. Because think about Deion Sanders, and I'm praying for Deion, I hope he does well. But at least he started coaching high school and you know went up the ranks. But um, but imagine you telling little you telling poor little Timmy to do the things Dion did. That's like telling uh Sea Biscuit to win the dog on Kentucky Derby. And that's why it's hard for great coaches because in their mind they don't they were so talented athletically that the small fundamentals and nuances, they overstepped because they didn't have to have it. They made up for it with athleticism, ability, strength, size, whatever. You understand? I'm not going to go any further, man. Listen, we over 100 likes. Thank you so much. We had 109, actually. I appreciate everybody. V12, you my dog to the end. You stuck in there with me. Everybody my dog. But listen, man, we go way back, but hey, we go back, boy. So I thank you, man. I just wanted to finish this out. Uh, next Wednesday, I'm doing the my uh, early national signing day is on Wednesday. All right. They start signing at seven o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. Look at it. Keep going, coach. I love it, man. Hey, I I'm going, but I got to do some things real quick. Hey, spitting facts. That's what I'm doing. But um, we're going to do a show that evening and we're going to basically break down all of the guys who signed with Miami. Uh, Excuse me, and see what it is. That cane juice gangster right now. That's another reason why I'm getting off here. So listen, we're gonna do all those guys uh who signed with Miami. We're gonna break them down. Let's look at their talent. A lot of these guys I did, and that dog on Tony Grimes from North Carolina who got the interception. I broke his film down already. He's supposed to have been a senior in high school this year. Instead, he's playing college football starting at a corner. That's tough. That's tough. So technically, this dude in the 12th grade playing. <laughs> playing power five football so anyway uh real quick check us out also i'm dropping my films every day i didn't do them this week I, like i said we got a lot of things going on go to coachhatesfootball.com you're more than welcome to check that out also i don't mention this a lot but you're more than welcome man all these shows are on your favorite podcast channel spotify uh, uh google cast overcast any cast so if you work out driving on the way or whatever and you want to listen to the show instead of trying to put it on youtube and about to have a wreck you know we put it on these these pop up on on the uh, all of the podcast shows so you're more than welcome pop them on there as well man other than that i'm out v12 you got anything else to say hey man you know hey you're gonna take it in stride it was a tough loss but guess what if you're here listening to this show if you comment if you called in if you if you if you're typing in the chat listen you are all UM fans, and we've been here before, so this ain't nothing new. We just want to make sure we keep grinding, keep getting better. Like like Buddy said, he's uh, he from Carolina, but he's been living in Miami 30-something years, and he said he's a Canes fan. He broke it down to Cortez Kennedy, Jerome Brown. I'm younger than him, but I know those guys too, bro, bro. Michael Irvin, I know those guys too. So listen, we go, hey, we still Canes. We're going to see what's going on for this bowl. Hey, and then whatever the next game is, I'm sure Coach, coach let us know. And we'll, we'll keep it moving in. Hope we can get a W and end this season outright, man. It's been a pleasure, Coach. It's been a long one, but it's been a pleasure.
Definitely, man. I appreciate you, man. Sure. Thanks for having me. Hold on. What does dude say? I don't know what you're talking about. Next, you'll tell me George Foreman can sell kitchen grills. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to it. It's always hard for me to get off these things. I want to say something because I don't want to go, but I got to go. And I'm going to leave y'all with this last little saying here. I thought it was important. Um, I know you said what I said earlier about my man, uh, uh, Ed Reed, and it was disrespectful. And as I, you said it, I like, damn, you right. But I'm going to leave you with this last piece right here. This is my man right here, man. Check it out. Come on with it. You missed it. I, I think we can hear coach. It was low. We'll try it again. Okay. That's better. Not hearing it. It's low. It's low, coach. Well, whatever it was, guess what it is? That was that was my man Kellen Winslow. And I brought it up, said, I'm a soldier. <laughs> All we care about is you. That's it. At the end of the day, we care about this you, man. So That's I apologize it. to that. I tried to be cool with it at the end. I blew it. But guess That's what? Right. I'm a That's football right. coach, man. I ain't blowing 62 to 26, though. I ain't read. Hashtag I ain't read. How about that on that note? I heard that, man. Let me go ahead and finish my Ed. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and put Ed back up there, man. And we're going to finish off with my man, Solo D. I always like to support him, man. I know we didn't win the game, but I'm going to put it back up there. Check him out, Miami Sports Music. And uh, I'm going to finish off with Ed Reed, and we're going into Solo D, man. Uh, you know snapping for that you is me A winning streak, let's get another one from UNC BCS still hating on us like they do it usually We still gon' kill these other teams and read some eulogies We just did a show in North Carolina and put Duke to sleep Almost put a 50 burger, had they whole squad nervous Solo D, it's always classic what I do on beats And I'ma throw the shoe forever, it ain't new to me Uh, I've been rapping since the Orange Bowl Meteorologist from everywhere the storm goes Just check my closet, Kane's gear all in my wardrobe Anywhere we take the field, we turn it to a war zone Yeah, heard the tall hills ballin', we ain't never scared We gon' turn hard rock into Gettysburg They callin' for a shootout, might be a wild day Let's light some up, we gotta hold it down for our blade Even in the quarantine, we support the team We tryna to get another year from King and Orange and Green All the recruits know the truth, it's all about that you So bring your ass to the crib, tryna to make moves We smokin' like a Garcia when you spark the flame Bunch of canes, hit Hall of Fame, go ask Edgin James Can't gang, can't complain, we always riding with them When UNC come in, I think we gon' Nate Robinson them You know snapping for that you is me A winning streak, let's get another one from UNC BCS still hating on us like they do it usually We still gon' kill these other teams and read some eulogies We just did a show in North Carolina and put Duke to sleep Almost put a 50 burger, had they whole squad nervous Solo D, it's always classic what I do on beats And I'ma throw the shoe forever, it ain't new to me uh.